Hello, CampCon. Uh, welcome to the uh, RPG uh, Creators Panel. Um, uh, we're uh, glad to come at you this afternoon. Hopefully, we'll get a lot of viewers. Uh, if you have some questions, post them in the comments. Um, I'll start by introducing my panel. Um, first, we have uh, Brendan LaSalle, um, uh, creator of x one of my personal favorite games, um, uh, and uh, a staffer at uh, Dungeon Crawl Classics uh, with Gooden Games. Um, uh, I first came in contact with Brendan um, uh, because I love x -Crawl. And last year, I wanted just to reach out to somebody and see if he'd do a video for us to say hello. And, and he did. And uh, we talk a lot now and then. Fantastic guy. Glad to have you here, Brendan. Thank you very much. Great to be here. Hello, CamCon. Um, <laughs> uh, William McCallslin, um, uh creator of the Mutant Epoch. Uh, he also does some art for uh, uh, some art, lots of art for, uh, for DCC and, uh, and other uh, outlets um, uh, and a, uh, a native Kamloopsian. Oh, uh, great to be here. Uh, we're glad to have you. Um, is that the term Kamloopsian? <laughs> uh, that's the one I'm using. It is now. <laughs> um, uh, Chris uh, Diaz uh, recently um, released um, uh, Ultramodern uh, 5 Redux, uh, which was, uh, I believe, it was an upgrade of Ultramodern 5, first one, which was also uh, an evolution of Ultramodern 4, which yeah. was for fourth edition, um, uh, writer of novels and other things. Uh, and he lives up in Prince George, isn't it? Yep. Yes, uh, I'm glad I'm getting my info right here. <laughs> We're glad to have you here. Thanks. Um, Andrew Daska, uh, lead writer on the Alien RPG, which uh, recently just won the Emmy, Emmy sorry, for um, best um, game. Uh, uh, congratulations on that, and thank you for joining us here. Um, thank you. He's also, yeah, he's also been a lore keeper uh, with uh, 20th Century Fox for uh, the Alien franchise, the uh, Predator franchise and Planet of the Apes, if yes. I am not mistaken. Yes. So uh, thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. Um, and finally, uh, last but not least, uh, Jason Sheets, uh, coming to us from Japan, uh, of all places, um, is uh, one of the founding members of uh, RPG studio um, Sons of the Singularity, uh, who released uh, a couple of years back the uh, uh, Sassoon Files, uh, which some people may have remembered was uh, uh, banned in China and all of their printed books burned. <laughs> oh, yeah. I didn't know about that. that I don't know one, that happened. <laughs> I read about that. Yes. Hello, um, CamCon. Yes. Thanks for joining us, Jason. <laughs> thanks for having me. Oh, we're we're pleased as punch for everybody to be here. Um, so uh, I'll just uh, we'll start off just because like the, the general idea was maybe just like getting into the industry or being in the industry and just letting the conversation build from there. So let's just let's just start with uh, how you all got into uh, the role playing game industry and maybe even role playing in general. Uh, can we start with you, Brendan? Um, sure. Um, I started playing uh, D and D with some friends uh, in '77 when I was a real young, young, oh, young, young kid. I know, right? And, uh, uh, but I never, I, you know, uh, like a lot of my friends, they all dropped out of the hobby, but I kept up with it. Um, and then um, when I was uh, in my thirties, I started running X Crawl, uh, which is my, the game I'm known for as my home campaign. And uh, my friends took to it, like they took to nothing else I had written. And I got a lot of suggestions. Oh, you should try to do something with this. Uh, so I eventually reached out to Panda Head Games and they, um, Panda Head um, were the first people to publish it. And uh, that was, uh, it, you know, it just, you know, I was, uh, I got a core book, but the first thing I ever did was a core book, which is not the way to go, as it turns out. Uh, you know, <laughs> do some smaller stuff first, yes. as it turns out, so. Uh, for those who, who are, aren't familiar with X-Crawl, um, imagine a cross between um, your standard dungeon crawl with your orcs and goblins and, and such like that with WWE and a live studio audience. That's pretty much X crawl and playing to the crowd. It's a friggin' hoot. Thanks. Yeah, not a problem. Um, yeah, and 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 that uh, that's that was your first gig was the core book. Yeah, first thing I ever did was a ninety thousand word core book. It was like that's pretty wild should. though. But yeah, I mean, that's yeah, obviously on the strength of the concept. Concept is probably pretty important, you know, that uh, it, yeah. it, it drives a lot of this stuff. So yeah, yeah no, that it's a solid concept. Thank uh, you. Thank you so much. 
Oh no! I, I again, I'm not trying to blow smoke up your skirt or nothing. Like I love that game, and when we when it first discovered, I'm like, how could people not want to try this out? So, uh, William, how about you? What's your uh, your your history with RPGs and and getting into the biz? That goes way way back to first edition, like <laughs> Redbox D and D. Yeah. Run, running a group for my brother at home, running a weekend group and a high school lunch hour group. And I've always wanted to be an uh, illustrator for the hobby. And um, the Mutant Epoch is really just a game that's come about by home brewing and um, uh, house ruling rather, so many other systems. And uh, when realizing we don't, it wasn't even recognizable anymore what we started out with. And uh, so we played that for like 20 years before I ever went to press with it um, back in 2011. Wow. Uh, okay. Twelfth book now, but um, but along the way, I was uh, did a lot of illustration, and I've been working for Goodman Games and some jobs with Brendan actually for yeah. nineteen years now. <laughs> so, so I'm a bit of a hybrid. So um, yeah, I think I came into it a, a lot of different ways, and it really made sense. I mean, it was a sort of pre-internet. If you wanted to get together and play fantastic games, you yeah. were doing it on tabletop. Yeah. I mean, it's still, as much as it's great to have these uh, multimedia versions and Skype and Zoom and stuff to do it, there's nothing like sitting at a table physically with other people and playing and interacting. It's, uh, and I, I'm, with COVID and everything, I'm really missing it. It's, it's, it's not the same, definitely. Um, uh, Chris. Uh, well, I started with the red box. I've been uh, writing since I was a fetus. So it's something that just comes right back to me. Um, and I, I've been writing homebrew stuff since the, I would say late eighties, early nineties. And I was running games that are just based on my own creations all the way into 2003, which is uh, when I started working on my uh, original Amethyst series. And then around that same period, I created my website to Serena to Dawn to post stuff like my alien fusion and other conversions. And I took Amethyst and realized, hey, that's actually original. So I went off and did that on my own, but I hired a bunch of great artists, got a, got a great shot in the arm from, uh, from Goodman back in 2008. Uh, and then Ultra Modern 5 came out and uh, kind of knocked my socks off sales wise. And that was, I, that's when I realized, hey, I can do this for yeah. a living. Yeah. So, and then, yeah. And then we just finished our last Kickstarter. And I think the last books, I, 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 oddly enough, I just got my books from the Kickstarter about three hours ago. For hey, Ultra Modern nice. 5 Redux? Yeah, like I literally just got this about three hours ago. I do love that cover. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah. So. Pretty sweet. Well, congratulations on that. But yeah, great. I heard it went quite well. Well, yeah, so that was, yeah, I've been, I've been, I've been into games longer than I can remember. I can't remember yeah. not playing games. What were your favorite games when you were younger? Well, d and is kind of a staple, but I was a huge yeah. fan. I was a huge fan of the West End stuff. So I like Star Wars. Mm -hmm. That was really my jam. Uh, I'm a big Mecha fan. So the number one product that I would play in my youth uh, would be Mech and Zeta and Cyberpunk 2020. So okay. Mike, Pons Mike Pondsmith is my is my god. Yes, so we, we would have if, liked if, to have gotten him. <laughs> if he's selling, I'm buying. So I was a huge fan mm -hmm. of everything he did. And I was a admin follower of his work all the way until... The, the later stuff and even with um, when he when he worked with fusion and then all that hero game stuff popped up so oh yeah, yeah i'm yeah i'm a big fan oh. of it because it, it's a great it's a great uh canvas on which to create mm -hmm. your own stuff and that's where well yeah mike pondsmith is like I mean if, if nothing else is amazing at uh, at world building and, and and creating all these textures and like i mean uh yeah, uh, I'd love to sit down with him every once in a while. That'd be yeah, and the, the RTG site back in the day was one of the few sites that would promote homebrew content. So, like I said, way before that people would have social media, you could mm -hmm. find my website through the Artels Orion site. That's something that's back then no one did. Yeah. Uh, Andrew? Um, so you, usually I tell people it started with the red box, but it actually... It, go, it goes back further than that. Um, oh. When I was uh, like seven or eight years old and playing with Star Wars figures, I was keeping canon with ideas then. Um, yeah. Like like kids would come to the kids would come to the um, you know play at, at my house and everything, and, and like six people would have Luke Skywalker figures. And I'm like, no, no, we can only have one Luke Skywalker unless okay, so that one's a clone that the Emperor created in order for them to try to infiltrate the Alliance. And I was doing stuff like this and pissing they off. They did people. that, by <laughs> the way. I think that's an actual story. Yeah, probably. <laughs> um, but I, I, um, 
yeah i so i was pissing off kids all the time and they never wanted to play with me um but this <laughs> this this led very easily to dungeons and dragons we're running the show like that um mm-hmm. but uh i gamed i i i i mostly game mastered i barely played yeah. um D. I played D D maybe three times the rest of the time i game mastered it for 20 yeah. years um i played a lot of battle tech i played a lot of star trek from phaser and i also i game mastered all the time the west end star wars um but <clears throat> about 10 years ago i stopped playing because there was no more time uh yeah. to play. and i um i i worked i worked on uh grand theft auto for rockstar games uh, with video game stuff. I did that for 17 years. And I, you know, during that, I started pursuing uh, working, getting, basically getting the Planet Apes license from Fox to do a novel that I wanted to do. Um, all that led to me, uh, the first novel I did for Planet Apes led to them being like, well, you seem to know this better than us. Do you want to be a franchise consultant? And I was like, oh, you actually <laughs> read it. Because uh, Josh Indo, who was the franchise director over there at the time, actually he actually read my novel, which surprised me. Instead of having some uh, intern read it and then rubber stamp it, um, yeah, that's wild. So that that led me to working on Planet of the Apes and then the other stuff. Um, and in regards to Alien, originally I was just brought in uh, for my franchise knowledge, just to write the setting stuff and everything um, <clears throat> for the game. I mean, yeah, uh, I wasn't supposed to write the adventures. I was just supposed to, you know, basically do all the lore stuff, and that's it. But then whoever they had for the adventures, I don't know if they dropped out or they weren't giving them what they wanted. I don't know, whatever it is. But they're like, hey, do you want to take a stab at this? And I was like, well, I got 20, 23 years experience of gaming at home. <laughs> Hell yeah, I'm going to take the opportunity to do this. You well, know? Give it a shot, yeah. yeah well, I and, mean, like, I, I have to admit, I was a little nervous asking you this question because I know I, I, I thought that, our, that Alien RPG was your first job in in this industry so 100 percent it is, 100% it is. Um, <laughs> well that's that's a nice start isn't it yeah no no i, I think i found my calling here um yeah but uh chariot is the chariot was the adventure i wrote and it's been mm-hmm. incredibly well received in fact it won won the uh uk game expo best role-playing adventure for the year um you're right over there you having problems nope i'm <laughs> just close oh, okay. out from the i thought there's something wrong with your ear i was like chariot yeah, of the gods chariot. Uh, and that just okay. got followed Andrew up with Gasker. Destroyer. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. <laughs> that just got followed up with Destroyer of Worlds, and there's more coming. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's, uh, I don't know, the, uh, not, this goes on to another tangent, which we don't need to go into, really. But the uh, the funny thing is, is that all this has made me never want to game master a game again. <laughs> I just want to play. So, you know, it's like I spent all this time crafting this stuff. Yeah. I don't want to game master anymore. I just want to play what other people I- I get how you can miss it. I mean, I think I started out obviously as a player. Most most of us do. Uh, and uh, my first time game mastering, uh, I was thrust into it. Essentially, somebody just said James will do it, and I'm like, Whoa. so. But not about me. Uh, Jason, we haven't forgotten about you. Sure. Um, what's, like- what's your experience with uh, with getting into the industry and your personal experience with with role playing? Sure. Like most people, I started with a red box. Um, I also uh, ran a wonderful red box. (laughs) And I ran a high school lunch game. We Mm -hmm. role played instead of, uh, you know, eating terrible cafeteria food. (laughs) Um, So, and I've gamed my whole life and, um, and I've GM'd and I've played. And uh, back in, I was in China and playing with a group and our game master, David uh, Vornay, um, really we were playing call of cthulhu and um at that time trail of cthulhu had just been published uh, by robin laws and kenneth height uh and um uh you know he really pushed that on us uh he said you need to read this this is uh you know some interesting uh, material and they have a different approach to gaming and i picked it up and and read what uh, robin laws and kenneth height had to say about um building scenarios And it was a watershed moment for me because up until then, um, you know, a lot of the published scenarios that I was uh, relying on and using would have plot holes and scenes missing, um, or it wouldn't be clear to me how they had structured it, what what Mm. the author was thinking about when when he put the the, the scenario together. And Robin Laws does a really good job with this idea of, you know, following a progression of of clues. And um, there's some really good instruction as to you know, if you're going to write a horror type game um, or a gumshoe type game, 
you know, you can build it this way and you can draw from history and you can draw from the headlines, um, you know, the news headlines. And um, from there, you know, I was running games in China and uh, I had an interest in 1920s Shanghai and uh, I was running a heavily modified massive Narlan Thotap type game. Mm-hmm. And we ran this game in China for, uh, you know, uh, we ran it twice. Uh, so uh, a year each time consecutively. And after that, I had a, a ton of material and thought, you know, this is pretty decent content and we can put it out there. Um, and the barriers to entry are um, low enough that uh, you can actually make it happen. If you can make your dream and your hobby happen and, and actually publish because uh, those barriers to entry are lower. Um, which it's is a lot easier these days. A lot easier. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it's not easy. I wouldn't say it's easy, but um, it's oh, I didn't say it was it's easy. A- I just said it's <laughs> easier. Right. I exactly. Mean, it's achievable, right? Yes. Full disclosure. Um, I'm actually writing a scenario for um, Jason's uh, newest uh, book that's going to be coming out, or the the, uh, the companion book. Um, uh, so it's I'm just this is going to be my per- first professional gig, as it were. Um, doing that so just just uh, like I said full disclosure yeah yeah so um, I'm, a, I'm a big democratization of gaming uh, we all have stories to tell and uh, you know if you have an interest put you know put a uh, pen to paper uh, get out there and start working on it and um, you know we can find a home for publishing it and um, mm-hmm. you know it, it's not going to be easy but it's definitely going to be rewarding yeah well you just sometimes you just got to do it I mean we've got people on this panel like William who created the mutant epoch like pretty much on his own I'm, I'm sure there were people who did help and such but I mean it's 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 your project uh Chris with with your books I, I'm, I'm not as uh, intimately aware of of how many people were involved with the production of those and 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 uh, and uh, so Amethyst was it again sorry well Amethyst like I said Amethyst the uh, the company brand of DSX uh, Machina was officially four people but over the course of two or three years uh, that got whittled down to one editor one writer and one artist and then one map maker and then the yeah. artist is out of North Carolina Nick Greenwood uh, I had about four artists on the first Amethyst and um, I got along with Nick so so well that uh, I I basically just stopped hiring everybody else. So so, which unfortunately <laughs> adds to the to the so kind of the time crunch because, you know, you 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 contract out several artists so you can get your product out in time. And when you have one artist, you're like, well, we we have to wait until he's done, and he's got a, a very high level of quality control. So mm-hmm. uh, so yeah, and then I have my editor out of Al- Alberta, and then and then I do I do I write and I do layout and I do everything else. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I'd say like this sort of led me into this topic. Actually, was I wanted to talk about um, how like the creation of an RPG, uh, more often than not, is very much a, a team effort. Uh, there, there are different people doing different things, uh, it, with some exceptions, obviously. Um, oh, I just lost okay. audio on you, bro. Oh, try again. Yeah, we lost audio for a second. Oh, okay. Um, just, uh, just more, more about discussing being part of. Uh, a, a team uh, working on these as opposed to working on something solo. Like in, in the case of Andrew being a novelist, obviously that's a, a solo endeavor. Um, and William creating Nipok sounded like a lot of it was done by yourself. Um, uh, and Chris, you, you have, you've done a lot of solo projects, but brought people in to help you. Um, how, how does that work um, uh, for you? working solo versus working with the team and the benefits and, and drawbacks thereof. Can we start with you, Brendan? Oh, sure. Um, <laughs> well, you know, luckily for me, you can work with a team because I'm only good at the stuff that I'm good at and everything else, <laughs> uh, you know, layout, like art design, like, you know, you know, like I, I, I don't have a real good visual sense and it's something I learned about myself works now that I work with people who do have really good visual mm-hmm. senses. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, I, I think that, uh, you know, the, the, you know, the, once you get into this, I mean, there, I, yeah, there are some people who do everything themselves, editing, writing, and do art and such, and some of them can pull it off. I absolutely could not, and I'm really grateful for the people that I work with and for them able to, you know, take the, you know, pressure off. I like to do the creative part myself, and like, you know, as far as like design and writing and then play testing, and there comes a certain point when it's like, all right, now it's time to talk to an editor, and now it's time to, to look at art and everything, and um, you know, and, and like, you know, the, the management side of it too, that's another huge part of it, marketing mm-hmm. and, you know, figuring out where to print things. 
Um, so I, I think what we do is super collaborative and um, I think that's the only way to go. I mean, I, I, you know, I have all respect for the people. I know that there are people, especially like now with um, with like drive through RPG, I know there are a lot of folks that will mm-hmm. go in there and make a PDF game that, you know, but like they do all the play testing too. Like I feel yeah. like you have to bring in the, the, the bare minimum, you have to bring in outside GMs to run your RPG, yeah. I think. Like the the yeah. absolute bare minimum. But I would hate to have to like decide which like if i had 10 pieces of art in front of me and had to decide well this is the good one i'd love i love them all let's put yeah. them all on the cover you know what i mean i couldn't you know i just couldn't you know hard to be the filter yeah, yeah. no I, I get that like i mean i feel that like with, especially with the design element the visual element I'm, i i i face that a bit with with jason myself I, it's like i don't know what pictures to put in or, or yeah. i don't know how yeah. to make a map or anything and yeah so um i think but, that um, sorry go on. oh no i was gonna say I, I think working with artists if you're not an artist is one of the absolute you know like it's 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 its own art form like how to approach an artist and say i would like to have this thing here for for the for the for the absolute best result you can't give them everything you have to sort of like let the artists do their own thing so yeah in fact william mccausland one of my favorite ever illustrations one of my adventures (laughs) called neon knights and uh he just took a line in the book where i was like i i I referenced this this uh wizard's ability to summon you know, heroes from all over the universe. And I just say something like, go nuts to, to the, you know, to the whatever and such. And in the, in the illustration for it, William put a whole bunch of Starship Troopers being summoned to fight these, uh, these uh, you know, D&D guys. And I was like, I saw that and it was like, you know, you know let, let, the, let artists do their thing. You know? Oh, yeah. That's a well, really cause... hard, that's a really hard lesson to learn. Um, not an artist and it's so essential. Word. Uh, if, you know, we do, we have a process at, at Sons of the Singularity where we uh, build an ARD, an art requisition document. People who don't work with artists will have a tendency to take that kind of process and then write a laundry list of things they think go in a piece of artwork. And then you, what you end up with is if you, if you try to hold the artist to that, you get this cluttered, terrible piece that doesn't express what, you know, the art, you know, the artistic side of that artist. He doesn't get to be creative. Um, and so, you know, picking a topic and then letting the artist, you know, do whatever they want to do with it and then letting them, you know, uh, create. Uh, that is a really hard lesson to learn and it's the most essential in, the, in getting good quality artwork for your for your publication. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, go, I get that completely. Um, Andrew, uh, in working like uh, Free League, obviously, over the last maybe five, six years, 10 years, has been really breaking out with some amazing stuff. Um, uh, so I, like, I, right off the bat, that would probably be a, a huge selling point for working with, uh, uh, with free league is that they've put out some real quality stuff. Um, in your case, like, at, like what would, what was your role, um, interacting with like the making of the rules or did you just write flavor text or how, like in, in terms of that, in terms of the teamwork, I'm kind well, of curious. Well, uh, a little background first though, the, the, the teamwork thing it's interesting for me because i, I have a i have a degree in fine arts and went to school of visual arts in manhattan mm-hmm. uh, i was trained by uh denny o'neill oh, rest in peace yeah. yes uh walter simonson was my graphic novel teacher so oh, I, have, I have all this art background uh klaus jansen my Indian teacher yada yada you're blowing my mind here jesus <laughs> yeah i got I was there at the right time so most of my projects that i have done that have been successful before the alien book were actually projects that I also creative directed and art directed. So like the, the Frick Planet Apes novel we did was um, an illustrated novel. Um, I art directed all the big names that wrote on that. I've actually, I made that book to launch my career. It cost me 40 mm-hmm. grand to make that book. And because of whatever nonsense that happened, I never saw a dime off of it. My career came completely out of that book. So I look at it as like, that was my college education. That's just your loss leader. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, it was totally worth it. Um, but. Usually when I work with people um, that I am not running that, I'm usually really disappointed with what it looks like in the end, okay? And it's because I I, 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 I was trained in all these things, so I could say, oh, they should have put that there, they should have, mm-hmm. okay? When the art started coming in and the layout started coming in for this alien book, I was like, I could not have done a better job than this. this yeah, thing I, I just I bow to the superior intellect. Uh, like, like yeah, Free League has some of the best design stuff out there. It's spectacular. <laughs> and um, the maps, the maps that are in the book, I've i they're pretty much my maps. Like I, all the, all they've done is cleaned up the line a little bit. Yeah, um, 
because I, I, I do all my maps that I give them. Um, I do it all in Photoshop with, you know, so it's, it's clean already, but they've turned yeah. it into streamline and everything like that. Yeah. And, and even when I look at what they've done to my maps, I'm like, God, my map looks damn good now. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's like, they, 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 they're great. Um, and um, in regards to rules and stuff like that, all the rules is, is not me. Okay. Yeah. As we've gone on further now, like what's in upcoming products, starting with Destroyer, actually, um, the attacks for the aliens are specifically me now. Yeah. Um, but I didn't know their rule system when I started writing this stuff. Yeah, so what I did, when we first sat down, I, I said, uh, I sent them this huge document I wrote saying, this is what I think needs to be in an alien game. Okay. And I, I, I put that, I thought the alien needs to, I, I was like, I don't, want, I don't want the alien to ever be cannon fodder. When this thing shows up, you need to know you're screwed. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's so, a grinder. Uh, yeah. Um, so, so basically, I, I had stuff like that. I had I had put suggestions for rules for post traumatic stress disorder in there, which eventually. Well, I don't even. Again, this is the thing. I don't know. I don't know if it eventually adapted into, or if they were like, "Well, yeah, we're already doing that with the stress." But regardless, yeah. the stress rules are 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 in line with what I was thinking from the beginning. Um, so it's like I see a lot of times, and even now, now that I'm doing the rules, a lot of the rule stuff on the adventures, I'll submit something, and Thomas is like, "Yeah, I'll fix it." And <laughs> his thing comes out, and I'm like, "That's it, one die roll. That's what you're doing." And then everybody's like, "Oh man, that was so tense." I was like, "Okay, I guess he knows what he's talking about." <laughs> but I guess there's, there's that level of give and take when you're working as part of a team. There are people who do it's like you're talking about. Yeah, you've had history in in design and stuff like that, but I, you'll always encounter somebody who's better at something than you are. 100. There's you, always you somebody better yeah. than you, no matter how good yeah. you are. There's always somebody better than you. Yeah. You know? um, and then there's somebody better than him too. Whoever. Yeah. So um, usually. Yes, but that doesn't, mean, that doesn't mean that doesn't mean you're going to get them all in the same project, though. And no, that's exactly. Where, that's what like Martin Grips art is fantastic. The the the, the design is great. Thomas knows what he's doing. Alien is a gateway drug to other games, yeah. I feel like because yeah. of the simplicity of the rules and yet the the, the, the terror well, and and like, the recognizability of the franchise definitely helps too. So we so. got lucky that this is one of those. It's rare for a franchise project, as far as I'm concerned where everybody involved in it really cares about what they're doing on this. And mm -hmm. it's just a, hey, that's a cash grab. So yeah. um, that's why it's doing so well. And, and yeah. you, any one of us alone could not have made it. What oh, it you can definitely feel the love in that, in that project. Everybody wanted to make something that was aliens and it's, uh, it's fantastic. It's, I, I'm glad I picked it up when I did. Um, William. Yes, solo, solo versus team. I mean, you have a very unique perspective on it. Although, when Brendan bringing up the playtesting, obviously you you playtested your your mutant epoch with your friends for ten years or something like that. So, oh yeah, uh, um, more recently, um, of course, Danny Seedhouse, who you probably know. Danny, yes, I know Danny. Local guy, yeah, excellent. Yeah, actually, the first time I ever encountered a mutant epoch um, uh, was uh, the first year of CamCon, and uh, oh, yeah. and uh, oddly enough, uh, sorry, Jeff. Uh, Jeff was running uh, AR, uh, was supposed to be running Starfinder campaign, but he was running late and didn't show up uh, for a while. And so Danny was like, oh, I, I can run this Mutant Epoch if you want. I'm like, sure, what the hell? I mean, I wasn't in charge. I was just there as a player. So he uh, brought it over. He's, and He's one of the writers for it. Too. Yeah. But um, yeah, I know back in the day I had to hire an editor. It's the one thing I really, you, you got to have an editor. Yeah. You no, know, or if you can't get an editor, excellent pr proof you know, proof, you know, readers and uh, play testers. But um, I do have hint, some hint artists. That, there's a point, there's a point you're making there. Uh, you got to have an editor. And, and yeah. one is good. Uh, hands down, that's the hardest part of, of my business so far is finding, you know, good editors and people who are willing to look at it. And you're always underfunded, right? So, uh, and good editing is not cheap. So sorry to be to cut you off. I just wanted to reiterate yeah. your point. No, so so don't true. be afraid to pipe in every any time kind of thing. And even Sorry, if you do have an editor, 10 years later, you can be looking through your book and you see a typo. Yep. That, <laughs> it's like it, it just emerged from another dimension. <laughs> I've gone through this, read this passage a hundred times. Yeah. And I see an instead of an ah, or just the little things, but like, oh, it just makes you crazy. Yeah, but you now read something, you read something, read something, and then your editor read, goes through it and goes through it, goes through it. And then like, a, a, like six months after you've got it and it's out and you've got the print copy, someone's like, you know, you forgot the word the. I'm like, oh. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, I suppose when you're so intimately familiar with it, you you start accidentally just scanning through it. It's like, oh, I know what I'm talking about here. Yeah, I mean, okay, this is good. But it, it's hard to, to, to focus on it and say, okay, I have to look at it a little more critically myself. So, <laughs> Well, for me, for example, when I, when I started uh, working with fourth edition rules with the original Amethyst Foundations that I was doing with Goodman Games, um, they got released. But at the time, not a lot of people really knew how the system could be twisted and tweaked. And I had a, there was a thread on RPG net and one guy who seemed to know what he was talking about was very, very outspoken about all the things I did wrong. Um, and he's been my editor for the last 12, 10 years now. So. Uh, I think sometimes it works out. I mean, exactly. I, so. I, I mean, my own, my own encounters with people in the industry, like Andrew, uh, when, when I first started chatting with him online, um, I was before realizing who he was informing him of how, uh, 20th Century Fox should be running. It's like, well, actually, no, this is not the way it is at all. So. Oh, you did a well, actually? <laughs> <Unfortunately, laughs> we were just talking yeah, about that before the stream. The kind well, of actually. like that. Like, it's it, really tough. Okay, that's really tough because I'll have people yelling at me about what they're doing at Fox and I'm uh, in alien groups. And I'm like, please look at my profile. Please look at my profile. Please look at my profile. <laughs> I got all of that out in the 90s before. I so I think like, that doesn't, I pretty went through that uh, range. I felt so stupid when, when you, when you, when I figured out and you told me who you were. And like, and, and the first thing I did after he tells me that, I'm like, hey, would you like to come to CamCon and be on a video stream or something? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and, that, and that's so, totally cool. It's like people, people, I don't always know who I'm talking to, but if I get into it with someone, I go and look at their page. I'm like, I'm not screwing up my career here, am I? Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, he runs DC Comics. Oh, well, that's yeah. <laughs> yes. well, let's give him a little bit of truck. <laughs> but, the, but the thing is, is that, you know, if I figure out, oh, wait, this guy, I'm like, oh, dude, okay. I didn't know that. Thank you. You know, but there's these people who double down that they've got to be right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that I cannot stand that, that toxic BS. It's okay to have a different opinion. It's yeah. okay to think you know something, and then when you meet the expert, be like, "Oh, I didn't know that." But okay. don't find the expert who's actually there at the job doing it. To yeah. tell it, you know. It's well, totally, that's what you do. I mean, it's like well, last last week when you had that guy on your Facebook post telling you that you stood on your mouse standing on the the, the oh, shoulders yeah. of giants. Oh, this guy was insane. Yeah, no, he was so, he's rabid. That's how uh, people yeah, like, appear giant. That's that's how the world works. <laughs> Well, I, I think the way to build up is to build on top of other other, other things. That's especially how, that's in this quite industry. literally how society operates. Yeah. Yes. Well, but in this industry as well. I mean, uh, like you, you take uh, like it all comes from Gary Gygax and making uh, the first Dungeons and Dragons and everything kind of expanded from there. And then Alien RPG is not just built off of role playing, but also off of a franchise and a story that exists. And uh, it, it all comes from somewhere like Call of Cthulhu. Um, uh, like Sons of Singularity work with H.P. Uh, Lovecraft um, and, and moving beyond uh, just the stories that were written um, to, the, uh, uh, to, to the idea behind the text and, and creating something bigger and better. Um, so, no, yeah, definitely fantastic. Um, uh, <laughs> Chris, um, yeah, I know you, you talked a little bit about working in a team. Do you have anything to add to that? Or is that you pretty much well, had what you I don't play well with others, if you ask my wife. So that, that's been always the biggest issue. I always think that uh, there's, there has to be, I'm extremely open to feedback when it comes to somebody who wants to help create someone's vision. But I always think that you should always have a captain of a ship, right? There should be somebody who, who keeps that, that focus on the horizon knows where they want the property to go. And then you have people that'll help you take that direction. I have a fantastic artist mm -hmm. who is absolutely committed to making sure. And I give him unbelievable amounts of freedom too much actually, because he keeps on asking me to re <laughs> reel him in. Cause I said, just start drawing. I'll work it into the store because I trust you implicitly. And I have, and I've let my editor create stuff on his own because I trust him, but you have to filter through, Sometimes having people that want to inject their own vision into mm -hmm. the story and you're like, no, 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 you're here to help me not to facilitate your, your idea. So for me, um, I love working with other people. If, some, if, I, if I'm brought on with, with somebody else's idea, uh, I, would, I love collaborating. I love offering suggestions when I can. Um, and now that uh, I've, I've gone into, oddly enough, uh, some f filmmaking, I've, I've done a lot of script work with the local production companies. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating 
when people throw out ideas like actors and, and, and director throw out ideas and I'm like, well, that's brilliant. And great thing about it. I could take credit for it. Yeah. <laughs> my name is on the credit. So my name's on the screenplay written by, and I can, you know, I get, and, and, and that, you know, when it comes down to it, uh, I really like that. But like I said, uh, when it comes to the, the property, uh, when it, whether, especially Amethyst, ultra modern, yeah, it's, 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 it's yeah. mostly crunch, not, not so much lore, yeah. but with Amethyst, it's one of those situations where there has to be somebody running that ship. There has to be some person that has that spiritual center that everyone revolves around. I hate, I hate to use the cult metaphor, but yeah. you, you got to have that, that leader. Like Drew is, is that leader. And that's, you can't have that operation working without somebody dead center that knows everything who has yeah. Who that, that that the group can 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 rally around and, and yeah. need people like Drew running that because if you didn't, you had a guy that was just like, oh, this would be fun, and then you have like three people working yeah. together and nobody can say no. This is the direction you have to go, and that's important. Well, yeah, definitely. I think there was a point you made earlier on about like the the artists wanting to be reeled in. There, I think a lot of really good professionals in the industry want proper direction as well. It's not that they want to be just let go and do your own thing. No, they they want to be told. What do you want? How do we want to do this? How do we want to afford? Because I think that's a sign of, of a great collaborator because they're not they're not being independent. They're realizing there's there's a larger vision going on here. Um, well, not Jason, all of us, I'm, not everyone, but everyone's lucky enough to find an artist that you can collaborate 100 mm -hmm, mm -hmm. from the get go. Like so, oh, definitely not. Yeah, there, there's synergy and, and 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 serendipity that needs to happen, obviously. Yeah. Um, and but when it does, it's obviously brilliant. Um, Jason, uh, obviously, as, as uh, the, one of the founding members of Sons and Singularity, um, you've, you've put out uh, like four books now, is it? Yeah, including Journal of Indochine. Yeah, uh, you've got the the the, the, the Kalman Tales. Kalman Kalman Chronicles. Kalman Chronicles. I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> and, and no, no, no. It's yeah. Kalman Chronicles, Rational Magic, um, the Sassoon Files, and then Journal of Indochine will be two books. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, you know, my partner, uh, Jesse, um, likes to play with uh, building systems and mechanics. So we're working on, um, you know, producing uh, some systems that are supposed to be seamless and, and rules light, but not so rules light that they're just, uh, you know, sitting around a, a, a campfire well, like or something. Like the lore system that you're... Yeah, the lore system. And, yeah. and there are variations of that that we're playing with at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we've got a long pipeline. Um, you know, uh, we founded our business two years ago and, um, you know, you'd be amazed at how many projects we have, uh, how, how this project start to stack up. Mm -hmm. um, all of our friends are, you know, game masters and they're all writing stuff and uh, many of them have an interest in, in publishing. So they'll come to us and say, hey, um, you've played this game with us. What do you think? Is yeah. this good enough to to you know put together and the answer is always yes um but it's, you know there's a cue but yeah exactly <laughs> like so. we've got so many other things we're doing right now and it, it's prioritizing i guess i mean yes. like i mean like getting involved i mean i i my 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 whole philosophy when i've been getting involved with cancon getting guests and and, and meeting people in the industry and getting my first gig in the industry is kind of bull in a china shop kind of thing i sort of just showed up and said i'm here let's do something uh, hey, that's, that's sort of contagious right i mean that's <laughs> yeah. awesome um yeah. that's the kind of reason why we're here on the panel and mm -hmm. the kind of reason why we game yeah, yeah definitely show up with that yeah oh i'm i'm, I'm not i'm not asking for an apology or anything uh, for myself for that i it's, it's the way i am and uh, I love wearing my heart on my sleeve in terms of that sort of stuff. Um, but in terms of like being at the, the top of, of this production company, that's fairly small and, and you obviously be using uh, Kickstarter to your uh, advantage. Uh, how, how has that experience been for you? Yeah. Um, so like most um, indie publishers, we're, you know, we're on a shoestring. Um, you know, we're, we're terribly undercapitalized. Um, <laughs> and um, Kickstarter uh, offers a, um, a way to get, um, you know, basically investment funds, money that you can use to spend on art and on editors and on, on all the things that go into producing a quality product. Um, mm -hmm. you never, you're never able to raise enough. And um, it's, a, it's a dangerous way to raise money because you can overcommit and, and end up, you know, promising to deliver something that you can't, you can't mm -hmm. deliver or you can't deliver on time. Um, and so with Kickstarter, you've got to be uh, very careful not to bite off more than you can chew. Um, you need to um, uh, be very careful on the way you're going to spend that money that you've raised so that you can uh, meet your, your backers' expectations. 
Uh, mm-hmm. And there are plenty of companies who lose their shirt, plenty of people who think that they're going to raise their money on Kickstarter, mm-hmm. uh, get it, get all their friends to commit, uh, raise some money, get some traction. And then, um, you know, then they find out that editing is not cheap. Yeah. <laughs> you know, well, or it's, they, like, it's like, I've kickstarted it. So it'll happen now. No, right. there's still a lot of work to be done. <laughs> you know, it's like, well, you know, we hit the stretch goal and now I'm going to produce miniatures and then we hit this stretch goal and now you're going to get dice and now you're yeah. going to get a GM screen and now you're going to, and all these, it, without thinking through what your, your principal product is, which is your content, um, you know, so when you, when you structure a Kickstarter, you've got to be extra, extra careful on how you structure it. Mm-hmm. Well, it's like, how, how uh, well, let's, we'll go back to um, uh, Chris. Uh, how, how do you think Kickstarter has helped to, to change the landscape of, of creating uh, RPGs and getting them out to the public? Well, I've been... With my first Kickstarter, it was entirely a digital production. Mm -hmm. And um, my Kickstarter ran about two months after Kickstarter opened up into Canada. So so the potential returns were limited because it was still kind of a burgeoning little franchise. And then- Which, which, was that Ultramodern? No, that was was Amethyst. The first Kickstarter I did was was the re-release of Amethyst, uh, which adapted for uh, Fate 13th Age Savage World, uh, Pathfinder in fifth edition. By the way, never do that. Yeah, that, that sounds very uh, ambitious. That it was, like I said, I had a, I had a guy who, do, who did the Fate and Savage World, but you can't keep three systems. I, I, at least I can't keep three systems in my head. I have to yeah. decompile one and then retrain a new one. And uh, doing that between Pathfinder and 13th Age and 4th Edition, 5th Edition, that was just a nightmare. Uh, uh, and I only, I quit my, my day job because I, uh, I was a salesman and uh for almost uh, almost 30 years about 25 26 years and i uh i left on my own volition and i figured you know what i'm going to give myself a few months to see if i can do this professionally i've been making money because ultra modern uh went uh, got all the way to mithril it was a huge success i wasn't expecting that i went on vacation the same day it launched and uh, it was fascinating seeing the sales pop through and just blow, again blown away just mm-hmm. how quickly that thing was taking off And I realized, oh, maybe I can do this at least temporarily as a profession. And so when I read the Kickstarter for Ultra Modern, I threw threw everything. I was like, this is going to work. Either I'm going to be employed for the next year or two, or I uh, I have to go back and and, and join uh, the blue collar outfit. And 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 that was Ultra Modern 4th? That was the Ultra Modern 5. Ultra Modern 4 was me trying to prove to Ultra Modern 4th edition people that the 4th edition system wasn't bad. It was a oh. losing argument. <laughs> yes. um, because at that point, because, because I sort of like, look at what you could break the system and have fun with it, but by then everyone had jumped ship. Yeah. And so when I did uh, Amethyst Quintessence, which is the 5th edition version of Amethyst, like I did with Ultra Modern, I just took the rules from Quintessence, stripped the setting out, expanded and came out with, with Ultra Modern. Then Redux, which came out... Uh, just just this year was my attempt of taking that system and giving it the proper polish that it deserves, doubling the mm-hmm. content and so forth. Yeah. Um, when I hit, I, when I hit, I, you know, I hit the goal within two days. And I was like, oh, this is fun. And then it was like forty and fifty thousand. And then at the end, you just it skyrockets. And you're like, yeah. oh, okay, never mind. This, I guess this is honey, we're buying <laughs> honey, we're buying furniture. <laughs> but the the, the, the the biggest thing, I, biggest takeaway, and this was a conversation I had on um, on Gamma some time ago that. Um, you absolutely have to make sure that you're being paid. Most of the time, the people who are writing are the people who are running the operation, right? You're, you're paying your artist, you're paying your editor, and then we kind of forget that we need to eat. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I need to procure food and shelter. Yeah. And uh, that's one of the things that most Kickstarters end up stumbling on because you realize you have so much work to do and you have put nothing for yourself. Yeah, and that's the biggest thing, and uh, one of the biggest misconceptions, especially when it comes to outsiders who judge people who do Kickstarter. Because I have some people mm-hmm. who absolutely uh, have, have criticized me for going Kickstarter and taking some of that money, so I I don't have to go to a full time job, and and they criticize that, and they don't understand the situation. Everyone everyone here knows the fact that yeah, you just need to tell them that it is your full time job. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we are our profit organizations. They have to pay the people who are working for them. So, and the person running it has to live somehow. Otherwise, they can't make the project happen. Um, you know, with, with with the Plan of the Age book, I said I I poured forty thousand dollars of my own money into that. Um, I was working for Rockstar Games, and I was only able to do it because I was making a ton of money working for them at the time. But all that was out of my pocket. That wasn't you know. 
And I did not see any, a penny for any of the work I did on that particular book because I paid for it all. So yeah, you have to, if I didn't have that other, the work that was paying for it, it wouldn't have happened. You, you, you totally have to account for yourself in these things. Otherwise the project just can't happen. Yeah, yeah. you'd be surprised the number of creators that, that forget that, that they forget that there has to be a ration put aside for yourself. I wasn't expecting to get, I'm getting married this year, but uh, you know, yeah. I, there suddenly there's a priority. That's not. <laughs> not Congratulations on your marriage, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> After two delays and. <laughs> well, the world is what the world is. Yeah. We'll be coming back around to COVID eventually. So um, mm -hmm. William, have you ever had any experience with Kickstarters? Uh, just on the um, backers end for uh, Reaper Bones. Oh. <laughs> miniatures. I think, yeah. Have, have you ever thought about yeah i have actually yeah maybe for... i'll just start out light with one of the adventures coming up after the expansion rules come yeah. out um but received. it sounds pretty good it sounds like yeah. a good option i mean it's it, to me it's, it also seems like it's a good way to for lack of a better word advertise uh, yeah. the products and stuff you know uh, yeah. it's, it's 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 a it's a, an interesting balancing act that needs to happen because there are i find a lot of kickstarters treat kickstarter like a storefront as opposed to a, yeah. uh, a, a a crowdfunding uh, source, um, and and I think you you it starts to lose its luster a bit when when it when when it loses that focus. Um, Brendan, have you ever had any involvement with Kickstarters? Well, I worked for I worked um, like logistic stuff on the Kickstarter some of the early Kickstarters that uh, Goodman Games did. Um, you know, answering emails and uh, doing that end of it and such. That part's terrible. Uh, uh, you know, um, so you know you know okay okay and, and anyone else has done this isn't it amazing how many people when you're doing a kickstarter that has a retail tier how many of them are getting ready to open up their own game store in two mm -hmm. weeks but they don't have a tax id number yet but could they go ahead and pledge at that retail level even now just in case <laughs> like a hundred like a hundred uh, per ton and that's the mildest of the sins of it um but um i mean obviously kickstarter is amazingly important to the industry these days um you know it's 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 huge but uh yeah oh get, get someone who really loves customer service to be your customer service person so yeah, you will, have fights. you will have some fights. <laughs> or do well, it yourself, like some people unfortunately have to. Uh, well, you have James, yeah, James, your mean, focus has been James. Your focus has been on how important Kickstarter is for the industry. But Chris touched on something early on about uh, his first Kickstarter, and it's the distinction between digital products and physical products. Um, you know, I think the I think that the fact that you can have a digital only product. Um, that's one of the things that lowers your barrier to entry. That's one of those things that, that is game changing for, for our industry. Yeah. Uh, no, and well, I went all, you're, I went you're all digital right. until recently. So, yeah, I, I, and I, I think like I'm, I'm grumpy old man of gaming. I, I like having a physical book to use to, to the extent that I, I print up PDFs that I bought because I, prefer to have something physical to sit and read. It's easier to have at the table than bring a tablet or, or run it off the computer or whatever or on the phone. Um, and, and that's just my angle of things. Again, like I said, I'm grumpy well, old one of the things, gamer. Well, one of the things people miss on Kickstarters that have both a digital option and a physical option is that once you, once you, have a, once you reach that physical uh, option, your costs have changed. Your cost structure completely changes. Oh, yeah. You have yeah. to pay for the print run. And, you know, um, and there's, and you don't just buy, you know, um, a thousand books. You have to, you know, you buy a thousand books. You can't buy a thousand and one. You can't buy a yeah. thousand and ten. And so you buy them in blocks and, and, it, and it's extremely expensive and it changes, it changes the economics entirely. And so when you're planning your Kickstarter, if you're planning on having a physical option, if you make sure that you've, you know, modeled out what it looks like once you hit mm -hmm. that, once you've unlocked that print run. Mm. Um, and that's Finally. it. That's it. That's a really th easy thing to screw up, by the way. Oh, I can be, imagine. Be well, very I mean, careful with that. There are probably a lot of million easy things to screw up in in any business, really. But uh, but definitely things to to keep track of. Um, uh, maybe coming back to um, uh, I'll start with Andrew on this one. Um, uh, obviously, you've been intimately involved with. Uh, like things like Alien and Predator and all these things over the years. Um, what is it like playing in someone else's sandbox like that in in a, a significant way? Um, okay, so 
the, the, this could get complicated. Um, That's fine. <laughs> it, it's it. When I was a kid, I watched the Planet of the Apes movies. Um, uh, the Saturday, I, I mean the the week, the four thirty movie every day. They mm-hmm. would have them in a week a, a week in the summer. They would play each of the Apes movies, and I just assumed that I must have missed movies or that movies were not part of that lineup. That there must be more Apes movies because there was all these just like disconnects between the, the previous films. It's like yeah. you know uh, Cornelius and Zero are arrested at the end of the first one. Um, and they're engaged, but they're married already, and they're Zayas's best friend in the next one. And you're like, what? Okay, because they didn't give a damn about that stuff back then. And they're like, yeah, people saw this in the theater a few years ago, and they don't remember. No one has home video. Yeah. So when it was on, you're watching that stuff, you're like, oh, there must have been a movie where this happened, is what I thought as a kid. And I put Planet of the Apes away for a long time in my head. And then when I saw them again in college, I was like, huh, there are no other movies. <laughs> I made that crap up. <laughs> yeah. So when I got the license to do the novels, I basically took that crap that I made up when I was a kid and turned it into the novels. Okay. Yeah. So and and everyone's like, oh my God, you answered all these questions, blah, 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 blah. You know. So basically that was the key that I've approached all this stuff with, where it's like the 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 what you have seen suggests something. Mm-hmm. So what everything you build should come out of su- what what what's been suggested. You may have this incredible idea that has nothing to do with this universe. Don't yeah. cram it in there. Take that and make your own thing with that. Yeah, totally. But, but but with this, there's there's what is there suggests so much already. Build out of that. Make that make sense. And that's just how the I puzzle piece in. Yeah. yeah, that's how I feel about playing in that sandbox. Yeah. You know, that's the, that's wild. Well, I mean, you say like I mean, uh, it, it's a it, little bit tangent, but. Uh, I remember reading a book by Scott McCloud called Understanding Comics, which is a comic book, awesome book. It's a comic book about making comics. And one of the points he makes about uh, panel um, transitions is that there is stuff that happens between panels, even when it's one panel, one guy looking left to a panel, guy looking right. You, in your mind, you see him moving his head, even though you don't see that happen. Um, To take that idea further, when you watch these movies, you're filling in with your own mind stuff that's happened between these things because it makes sense to you and that's how you move on and that's uh, I, I think everybody does it whether they realize it or not it's like oh this must have been what happened and they can easily move on from it because well i mean it's see, a lot of, of what i see in all the fan groups on all these things lately just especially star trek fans they piss me off so much it, it's a, it's like <laughs> it's like well we never saw that so how i was like i mean just put two plus two together okay you don't need that on the screen to make the leap that that must have happened between yeah. them. You know, it, it, it's it, it's very strange what's going on in all these the fandom of these franchises. Mm-hmm. There's just well, this, I mean, actually, yeah, fandom is a whole other topic, but I something yeah. I go off on a lot on my blog and stuff. Um, well, it, it gets difficult to handle. I mean, like take Star Trek. Now you've got a new animated comedy show that's out. Now, how far is that into canon, or how adjacent is it? Uh, who knows? As far Everybody's as I can have an opinion. Of canon. Those things yeah. happen. Yeah, <laughs> um, just maybe maybe someone who's a real jokester is telling the story of how it happened. You know, yeah, you got to think totally. about the unreliable narrator. Even with Alien, um, assuming assuming that David's saying that he created the alien, you really can believe David. I mean, the guy the guy's a murderer, and <laughs> he's, he's like Charles Manson. You're gonna believe well, everything Charles Manson says? Or <laughs> no, I'm not gonna tell it to him to his face. Uh, yeah. like, you created the alien, sure you did, pal. Not a problem. So you know. Um, it, you got to look at this stuff that um, we're in the movie or in in this in that franchise in that particular story. Um, the, the Alien Three, where did the, how did the egg get on board? Is that really what the story of Alien Three is about? <laughs> no, it's not. And is it a plot hole? No, because the plot of the movie is not. A, this egg is suddenly there. It, we, we're going in with that premise. The, yeah. the, the continuity issue is between the second and third movie. Yeah. So. That's the type of thing I would look at and say, okay, what story can I build out of that? Yeah, there there are ways to fill in those continuity things with Alien, obviously, uh, and that and that's fine. Um, uh, now, in terms of, of playing in other people's sandboxes, yeah. um, uh, uh, Brendan, um, uh, obviously uh, less less uh, uh, thematically and maybe more crunch, like using somebody else's um, 
uh, rule sets. Like when you created the first um, X crawl, you used D20. Um, uh, I, I sold that book a year and a half ago. I wish I had it now. Um, <laughs> I got the updated version. So, um, but uh, like, what what is that experience like using? Because like that was a big boom when D20 came out and said, "Hey, yeah. use the rules, create supplements, go nuts." Well, it was amazing for me. That's really what made me think that I could do this. I remember um, I got the 3.0 books immediately and I hadn't played actual Dungeons and Dragons in a long time. Me and my friends had switched to other games and I got excited about D&D again. And then like a few months after that, I got the Star Wars D20. And it's not my very favorite version of Star Wars of, as a role-playing game. <laughs> I'm not a systems grog nerd. With one exception, the West End Star Wars game. West End's <laughs> the only one. You know what I'm saying? For God's sake, one time. Well, it's the one thing. But um, but uh, like seeing how easy it was to, you know, change to you know to to adapt those rules into other kinds of settings and scenarios made me go, whoa, this is something we could work with here. You know, and that was really the the. Um, the impetus for like, well, not for creating X Pro, like not for publishing, yeah. I, but for creating it. Like I was like, yeah. oh, I can just put all these in a big stew pot and and you know whatever, you know. This and like in, in the in the original X Crawl campaign, in the very first dungeon I ran, the last monster was the um, oh, I can't think of the name from Star Wars, the monster now, the Rancor. The Rancor? It the, yeah, yeah, it was the Rancor. And the idea was in the in the world of X Crawl. The, they had basically created the Rancor as a top promotional tie-in to the Star Wars movies. <laughs> awesome. so they awesome. built that monster to be there, and then they sold DVDs and tickets mm -hmm. and T-shirts and all the things you know throughout there and such. And that was sort of like my way of um, of uh, like you know um, you know sort of like in, in, you know introducing all of that and such. So for me, working within that system. Um, you know, I, I love doing that. And I'm a, I'm a tinkerer. I love taking extant game systems and seeing how far you can take them, what you can do with them, all of the different changes and things. That's, that's you know, you know I, I, I have created exactly one system. It took me a long time and the book never came out. It was like, uh, but, um, uh, I, you know, I, 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 I like to, I think that having an extant system, a good one, one that you enjoy playing enough that you want to design it. I think having that um, to me, uh, really, you know, is, is a creative boost to me. You know, it's like sort of like seeing, I, I think working within frameworks makes you be more creative. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And working against restraints absolutely makes you be more creative. And once you adopted a system, especially when you're saying, okay, I'm going to adopt this system and whatever I do with it has to be backwards compatible with the other parts mm -hmm, of that system. Mm -hmm, once mm -hmm. you do that, that really makes your brain, you know, catch fire, I think, you know, and uh, yeah. you really come to a lot of um, interesting places because of that. Well, that's pretty wild. I mean, but I think there, there's definitely a, a level of of realizing what the system is good at to begin with. Like, uh, uh, Jason, um, you you've worked with uh, Trail of Cthulhu and Call of Cthulhu now with uh, with with uh, Journal of the Um My my experience is completely with Call of Cthulhu. It's my favorite game. Um, uh, sorry to everybody else here, but <laughs> <laughs> um, but. Wow. Uh, uh, but Call of Cthulhu is, I mean, it, typically you'll find it on those lists of best games that aren't D&D &D, at the top is Call of Cthulhu. Um, and it's a blast to play. Um, but thematically, uh, and you've, you've described Trail of Cthulhu to me a couple of times, and I'm very intrigued by the way that they run it. Um, can you speak to the, the especially in terms of, of making supplements for it, the differences between them and, and, and using those systems and playing within them? One of the most important things that Paul Graham Press and, and Robin Laws and Kenneth Height teach when they release uh, Trail of Cthulhu is the importance of building a game system that, uh, that highlights and matches your setting and your themes. Um, and there are a lot of different ways to do storytelling, a lot of different ways to build games. Uh, you, want game you want your game system to be built around the, the, the way you want to tell a story and the setting that you're telling that story in. And uh, that makes a big difference. Um, you know, we, there, there is no great universal game system. I mean, GURPS was an attempt at that. There are some other uh, systems out there that attempt to be this universal system, but um, they get crunchy and, and it gets difficult to, they, they become what, what I say is they're not seamless. They, 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 you know, I shouldn't have to flip through a 400 page book to find a rule on something as a game master when I'm running the game. I ought to be able to adjudicate very quickly and mm -hmm. I don't, and I don't really want my players to feel 
uh, the game system, except to the extent that the game system feeds the narrative and the storytelling. Yeah. And, and so, you know, when I evaluate game systems and I, and I choose which one to use, I choose which game system to use based on what store, set of stories I want to tell. That makes sense. I, I mean, I, uh, William, um, have you used other systems in terms of your writing or is, are you you're writing strictly um, Mutant Epoch? Yeah, it's called the Outland system. I guess the closest thing it would be related to would be the old Star Frontiers, the 2D10 system and hybrid with Traveler and maybe Boot Hill. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> back, like the, the, yeah. The pedigree goes way back on that. Um, but I, I actually, standing I on the shoulders of giants. writing some 5e <laughs> fantasy stuff. Every once in a while, I get an itch to write some fantasy, especially around the Lord of the Rings season at Christmas, where we all sit up there and watch the the Hobbit and Lord of the Rings, and I have my scotch, and I just love that. I just like, man, I want to do some fantasy stuff now. It's post-apocalyptic and get it, you know, it gets a bit oppressive. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm just, I don't know, just to satisfy that itch, I'm just thinking of doing a little bit of 5e, maybe a trilogy right of adventures. Right on. Oh, or we'll decent. look forward to that. Yeah, no, I, I like, well, in terms of, I mean, I got fantasy burnout a long time ago, and it, it was yeah. like, all we were doing was fantasy, and I just, and it, for the longest time, I, I didn't GM or even play any fantasy. It's just like, I'm sick of it. It's so samey. It's, it's the standard thing. I want to try something different. I want to try something more interesting. Um, and uh, especially when I was GMing, I, I, it's like, I was getting all meta ideas. I'm like, oh, what about a game where, where the, the characters eventually encounter you guys as players? Wouldn't that be wild? And it's like, it's, it's one thing to think it. It's another thing to make it happen. Um, but uh, you, you know, one thing that we didn't, one thing that we didn't touch upon is um, open game systems versus you know the walled garden. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're a content creator but you don't hold the license in a in, uh, in a closed you know set of content, um, you know you really can't play there without a license. Or uh, you can play there in certain ways, but uh, there are limitations to to what you can do and, and what you can't do. And so when you as a content creator um, picking a game system is a, an in interesting challenge. You, you think, okay, I want to write this content. Let's say it's set in Texas in 1860s. All right, well, what, you know, what game system should I use for that? Um, and I will look at the different possibilities, but some of those game systems I rule out immediately because I don't have access to it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's going to require a license. I can't get the license. I don't like the terms of the license. Yeah. Um, you know, and the alternative to, to choosing something that is already created is to build it yourself. The downside of building it yourself is you don't have a community of players. Yeah. So you might be building a system that nobody ever plays and you've got that heartbreak system that you just yeah. built. Yeah. Um, so, so there's a lot that goes into, for us as designers, I think there's a lot that goes into deciding uh, whether we're going to build it or whether we're going to use somebody else's and if we're going to use somebody else's system, yeah. uh, which, which system do we you know, pick or choose from depending on the content that we're writing. Well, yeah, that just comes all the way back around. I mean, choosing the right system for the right, right game. I mean, when I when I first started running Call of Cthulhu, I was actually using the D twenty rules. Burn <laughs> <laughs> it with fire. Just, yeah, I know people <laughs> people don't like hearing that. Um, but that was that was my because I I'd just gotten back into role playing after like I hadn't played it in ten years, and that was Red Box here as well, um, and then got together with a group and and started playing fantasy role playing again and and then they said oh we want you to run something and i was like oh, i'm sort of interested in looking at call of cthulhu they have this new d21 and that's what they have me starting to run um in my own experience now uh, i i run with with core stance uh the seventh edition call of cthulhu now um and and realizing that uh there are things that systems do better than other systems d20 is fantastic for action if you want things like action and boom, 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 it's great for that. You want a little more layers and 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 developing like like tension and fear. The uh, the call clue system is fantastic for that, um, and and it obviously does it better. Like for me at least, because I've evolved to it. Um, and and over the last two years, involved with CamCon, I've gotten familiar with a whole bunch of different systems um and just discovering new things and i mean and again bringing it back you know uh, i've just started getting back into fantasy role play again because of dcc 
um, I, it was like the breath of fresh air. I needed to want to do fantasy role playing again. Um, so for anybody who has been burned out on fantasy role playing, check out Dungeon Call Crass Classics. It's it's mind blowing. It's it, it changed the game for me. So, um, one, yeah. One of, the, one of the things, though, I mean, that we really you got to like. Okay, so D twenty or any of these other generic uh, open license that can be used for anything uh, mm -hmm. systems. You have a players and they like they like Dungeons and Dragons or they like this one game and they're like, well, I don't want to try another game. I don't want to know another world system. It, so it's really important to use, say, the D20 Cthulhu system to get people into Cthulhu. And then they're like, oh, I love Cthulhu. No, now you move them to the seventh. You yeah. know, it, 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 these things play a, a big role in, in getting your players into other things. Evolving them, yeah. No, and definitely, I think the, the players that I, that I started with, the, the, the D20 called Cthulhu, they were all strictly D&D &D fantasy role players. And I said, I want to do this. And they're like, okay, what the hell, we'll give it a try. Um, right. and it turned out being one of the best campaigns I've ever run. And it was the first thing I ever ran. Um, had a lot of fun with it. Uh, and, and, and you know, once you get that, as a GM, you get that, uh, uh, that, that itch in your head about how you GM and, and doing it. It's hard to get rid of it. I mean, I love running games. I like playing games, but I love running games. Um, and, and yeah, it's uh again it's something i miss and uh uh can't wait for life to get back to normal uh hopefully <laughs> soon we shall see um i had a question that came through uh the chat actually um jessica uh, was wondering uh what was the thing that made the light bulb go on in your head to come up with the basis of any of your particular games or adventures does anybody have any uh, uh interesting comments based on that um well, I, I can for X crawl. Um, so the uh, for uh, X crawl, uh, I just had I had a weird vision in my head of you know. So X crawl is modern fantasy, and um, mm -hmm. uh, it started off with this vision of a um, like a, I saw a warrior with a little digital clock stuck on the inside of his shield, <laughs> standing there like you know in, in my mind, I, I, you know. When my dad had one of those stuck in the, in the inside of his truck. You just like, yeah. you know, didn't have, didn't have a you know didn't have a, a built-in clock, and you just stuck one there. And I, I pictured him like sort of like berating this thief for taking forever to to pick, pick this lock, and talking to him like in my mind is like you know what we, the clock's running down, we're gonna lose. And it's sort <laughs> of like like the whole the whole game spooled out of that one vision. But of course, that was all built on years of playing Dungeons and Dragons, years yeah. of watching sports. You know, and uh, but that allowed me to create this this uh, system, Dungeons and Dragons, where I could put absolutely anything I you know purple polka dotted monsters I want to. I could put absolutely anything in there, and then I, I never have to think of why they're there. You know, like like that vision allowed me to sort of like create this world where I could, without any thought of um, like the ecology or making any natural sense, I could put sort of unnatural challenges together and sort of draw from all of the other things that I, I you know, you know uh, really enjoyed in gaming growing up, and just sort of put them together in this big mishmash. Why is it there? It's there because there's a producer who said, we should have more whatever, you know what I mean? Yeah. More zombies, yeah. more traps with fire or whatever it happens to be. So, so that was, for me, that was, it all kind of came out of that one moment. Yeah. Uh, light bulbs. Uh... And maybe uh, Chris, like with, with Amethyst, what was the light bulb that, that created that concept? Well, originally Amethyst was a, um, a, a very basic story that I wrote back in the late 80s about a post-apocalyptic story, a post-apocalyptic earth with dragons in it. And then the film um, Ring of Fire came out and I went, well, there goes that idea. <laughs> and uh, fast forward 10 years later, if anybody wants to get into three a third, third edition dnd and i was like oh sure well, i was like well and i've been a gm 99 percent of my time as a, a as a guy in gaming and so i create original worlds he's like well create me a setting i was like okay i'm going to take this amethyst and just cram it into third edition and, and 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 play with it and over the course of uh 10 12 years i've been slowly refining it so it's never been one singular light bulb it's actually about 75 light bulbs over the course of 10 years when it mm -hmm. comes to the setting fluff like the first edition i was compromising a lot of the uh, of the game to fit the mechanics 
And when you write for Fate or Savage World, you don't have to do that as much. And by the time we got to Quintessence with Fifth Edition, I was writing for Thirteenth Age as well. For Thirteenth Age, I love. Um, it's 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 this it's it's I I get to compromise less. So the the latest versions of Amethyst, especially with the, the latest book Factions, which came out a few months uh, ago. I can finally say like, this is about 95%. It's pretty close there. Mm -hmm. uh, but when it comes to uh, a, a crazy idea, like sometimes we, we, we get ideas and we went, oh, fantastic. And then about a, a week later, you're like, I'm insane. Why am I? <laughs> so, so there's this project that I got unlocked on Kickstarter. So my campaign reached, blew past the last campaign. The campaign was just like, you unlock a new setting called Affinity, which is an idea I, I had. And I went, great, now you have to write this. And then, Games went to production, books got shipped, redo is all finished, and I'm sitting here going, Ooh. okay, I have to create this. And the whole idea of Affinity was there was three settings that had similar ideas. Now, that seems like an interesting idea and concept, but you don't real I, I didn't realize that I would have to write the three books simultaneously to make oh, sure that if I create a person in one book, I have to create them in the other two. <laughs> if I create if I if I if I state something like this is the empire of Corvos. Well, then I got to cut Corvos in the other two. Mm -hmm. And it created this thing. It was supposed to be 100 page supplements in each one. And now they're 250 pages each. <laughs> and they're still kind of expanding, both with the narrative and, of course, with the art. And he's like, and he, he, drives, he draws an idea and I tell him an idea and he's like, oh, that's amazing. I can't wait to draw that. He's like, yeah, that's just one book. You have to draw it two more times in two different settings. <laughs> and so you get this idea and I think, this is, I bit off more than I can chew because I've been, I've been writing this thing for the last uh, eight months. And now it's like in excess of 600 pages in, in three volumes. And they're all being released on the same day because I can't finish one. I, I literally had one done and I'm like, well, I have to add in this now and I have to go into the fluff. But the idea is, I, I'm telling you, like, where's the idea? Okay, so every single one of these books has the same 12 empires, the same characters in the same story, the same plot line. So the same romantic subplot in the fluff is happening with these characters. The same villains are popping up in the similar stories. And so I have to create this, but they have to be completely different settings. So mm -hmm. one is on a giant spaceship. The other one's on a giant Taurus world. The other one's in a giant orrery. It's all, and they have to have these common themes. And then, then a week later, I'm like, what am I doing? This is insane. <laughs> and, but that's one of the things I love about writing within. I'm glad I don't have to write the system. I'm glad I get to write. I get to paint somewhat. And because thanks with fifth edition, even fourth edition, I think any system, any system you can create, you could turn in, you could put your setting into any system, mm -hmm. right? It just depends on how you interpret it. Like mm -hmm. Amethyst works for Fate, Savage World, 13th Age, fourth edition, Pathfinder. I've run it in three different systems. And I have never been, felt like, well, this wouldn't work in fourth edition. I mean, fourth edition was considered the most stifling system for a lot of people because it was so mechanically tight. But for me, I'm like, when they came out with the GSL and things were defined specifically, like this is what an elf is, this is like that's the GSL. And everyone mm -hmm. went, oh my God, we're not touching this. And they all ran away. And I'm like, fine, <laughs> great. I don't, I mean, so it was like, oh, I can't define an elf anymore. Okay, then I'm going to create nine brand new races. Mm -hmm. And I had those races already, but they were elves. I'm thinking, now I'm going to create brand new lore. And I'm not going to mention. So when fourth edition, the GSL came out, I found that more liberating. So I was able to dive into it and, and explore that space, you know, like, uh, like the cowbell. I wanted to explore yeah. that studio space with that cowbell. <laughs> and that's what it was. And so I, that's why I love painting in, 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 in within on, on a canvas. The, the rule mm -hmm. system is a canvas and uh, I, I'm just there painting happy little trees. Oh, but, yeah. I, uh, but, I, I, but I won't paint outside that canvas because that's, that's not something people are going to see. Oh, yeah, definitely. I think people forget that uh, the creation of a, of a rule system is just as much an art form as writing the stories and writing the scenarios, uh, making that all kind of fit together. It's not just mathematical, even though that's definitely an element of it. But, yeah, well, uh, mechanics, but... I mean, at, with Ultra Modern, which is, it is by far the most, I mean, I'd like Amethyst to be the most successful, but it's not. Ultra Modern is 95% is crunch, but that's still liberating. When you get, yeah. I got fifth edition and I'm reading through it. And instead of looking at what options they gave you, I was looking at everything between the lines. What are they defining? What can I tweak? I was like, oh, so this is happening and this is happening. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. you find you find that space between spaces and, you, and then that's where you find your new classes. And that, you know, people yeah. like, I remember people saying, oh, you can't do 
uh, D20 Modern with uh, with fourth edition. And I was like, well, that's not true. <laughs> and and people said the same thing with fifth edition. You can't do modern with you can't do sci-fi with fifth edition. Yeah. And there's actually about a dozen people, oh, a dozen yeah, publishers a that have more than proven that yeah. that's that that that's BS. Yeah. No, and uh, you know, we take it as a challenge. So sometimes sometimes in a, I'm in a fluff mood, and sometimes then I'm in a, a mechanical mood. Like mm -hmm. for once again going back to affinity, I was an idiot and decided I'm going to create three different magic systems for these books. <laughs> So one works on a deck of cards, <laughs> the other one works off of, of, of a replenish, and then of course redo has its own system. So I've created four different magic systems because I'm an idiot. So what I'm getting here is that you hate yourself. Uh, yeah, there's there's, there's <laughs> some self hate. There's no denying that. Some, I mean, some self flagellation going on. Oh yeah, oh absolutely. <laughs> But that's that's you take that as part of a challenge. Like say, I say, I said I want to do a magic system that uses uh, that that works within Dungeons and Dragons, but uses a fifty-two deck playing card. Yeah. And I was like, great. And then I spent a week and a half staring at the deck, going, now what? Now what? Yeah. Well, but I mean, that's, what you, what, that's the yeah. challenge. That's the fun. And everybody here has that challenge. Whether you know, sometimes yeah. they're they're creative with, with the fluff. Okay, this race has to get here into this position. How do we do that? And sometimes yeah. it's mechanics, you know? Yeah. Well, I think, I think every GM encounters this in a different way in that there are sometimes situations that the rules haven't really thought about or aren't clear on. So you just got to make it up as you go along. I mean, rule zero, if a rule doesn't work, don't use it. That's pretty much what every role-playing game says, you know? You, in the, at the end of the day, you want everybody to have fun. And so if you need to just figure out a different way to go through it that's what you do i don't know any gm who hasn't done that and so i think that's it's, it's vital to to be able to, to 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 think outside the lines not just playing but obviously when you're creating you know you're, you're taking those elements and saying yeah there, there's a way i can build beyond the scope of what people think this can be and that's when you come up with something great um jason uh You've done writing for, like, scenario writing for your uh, for your books, obviously. Just coming back to that uh, uh, light bulb, um, one in particular, um, uh, La Roulette, which I know you're extremely proud of. Um, uh, if you're able or willing to talk about it, um, uh, the light bulb idea for that campaign, uh, and maybe give some some reference for it. Uh, yeah, that, that 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 campaign comes out of a. Uh, a conflict in French Indochina, um, uh, uh, something called the Battle of RC4, Root Colonial 4. Um, and it's an example of a game uh, that I wrote after pulling from history. Um, let, me, let, me ask, let me answer the, the bigger question, which is about light bulbs um, and ideas, right? Um, so my partner and I, uh, we read a lot of science fiction. We read Charles Strauss, Richard Morgan, Ian Banks, uh, William Gibson, Philip K. Dick. I mean, we're, we read, we're, we're voracious readers and we like to talk about the things that we're reading, um, especially, uh, you know, in that post-humanism or cyberpunk space. Um, and, um, you know, we, we use that material to help us think about what we want to write about. And we draw on that inspiration. We draw, if we're writing Cthulhu, we draw on Lovecraft and the, and the other writers who are in that Lovecraft space. Um, and, and, you know, role play serves um, a lot of different purposes, but one of the purposes that, that I like to put role play to is exploring social and moral issues. And the best way to explore those social and moral issues are to put player characters, players in settings where you call out those issues um, and put the, you know, have them put on the shoes of the person who is oppressed or the person yeah. who has you know, rights that he should be exploring. Um, and we, yeah. and one, one, one way to do that in historical setting, if you're going to play Cthulhu and you're going to play a game that's set in a historical setting, draw it from your history. Mm -hmm. So La Roulette is what we, you know, we drew from history. We took a real world situation and then we built a story around it. And it's not an easy scenario. I'm proud of it, but it's not for everybody. Um, we deal with, it, it deals with, um, attempted suicide it deals with survivors of remorse it deals with cannibalism it deals with greed um you know it those are those are mature topics um mm -hmm. now you could and, and so a lot of roulette i think is designed for a certain type of player mm -hmm. but you could for example if you wanted to take role playing and teach children uh how to how to 
do world creation and be creative and engage in creative writing and think about the world, it's a really wonderful instructional tool. Oh, yeah. You could build a D&D campaign around the idea that, hey, the orcs are being oppressed, uh, wrongly oppressed, and now they need some heroes to help them. You yeah. don't have to go hack and slash orcs. You could yeah. explore You could explore real social issues in a way and present it for children in a way that's educational and, and helps them think about the world. Oh, and, definitely. And so I love it. it. Yeah, go ahead. I, sorry. I, I love it when, when a game doesn't need to be all about combat and... Uh, and, and conflict. As much as, as those elements are fun in, in an adventure game, yeah, you want to have a fight and you want to come on top and, and it's, it's fun and exciting. But as a GM sitting there playing, and I, I did that once with a, a D20 Star Wars game where we had an entire session, four hours long, where there was not one fight and everyone had a great time. It was all about talking to the right people and making like social roles and stuff like that. Um, uh, but making that engaging uh, is you know writing that into a scenario and, and, and finding ways for the players to have fun with it uh, is obviously the tougher part and and I, I did it by accident it just sort of we ended the evening and somebody said hey we didn't have a fight this session I'm like oh my god we didn't how did that happen so well, I'm actually pretty, I'm pretty certain that uh, any of the GMs that are that are in this chat or watching have probably can make that claim I, I know I mm -hmm. have had dozens of sessions where not a single die roll was made uh, because it's about it's about telling your story and sometimes like for me when I make redo is designed for other people to play within that sandbox to give them those tools to create their own stories and then amethyst is just my version of that story within that mm -hmm. framework um, but you're but um, you're absolutely right uh, talking about and I think Jason said it best the uh, being able to tell more complicated stories in role playing, and that's been a fight that I've been having, and I'm sure everyone here has been having. And I can see you nodding there, so you know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> yes. The fact that there are some people that just like like D and D is elves, dragons fighting. They want dungeons, they want levels, and so forth, and that's great. And you have roll twenty and 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 other formats allow you to do digitally. And the reason why I always play personal is that I play music, I have everything, and amethyst, for example is well most people don't know this that amethyst i wrote during my crisis of, of faith i literally wrote it and i went from one religious belief to another over the course of writing it and uh especially in exploring it with the novels but the novel lore is in the books and i've had and oddly enough the only criticism i've had the only negative review that you can that i can see that of course, annoys the hell out of me because that's what we do. We focus on the <laughs> negative and don't look at the positive. Is that as someone who, who who didn't go off on the mechanics but went off on the philosophy of the story? He 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 first of all spouted his 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 credentials, which they do, and mm -hmm. um, went off about telling me how unrealistic my points were regarding philosophy because Amethyst deal deals with. You know, you know, faith in gods. Amethyst doesn't have a doesn't have a proof of God or gods in this setting. It still requires mm -hmm. faith, so there's no clerics, and that's just one thing. You're dealing with slavery. You're dealing with the the you know our belief in fantasy worlds and the irony. I mean, there's almost a satirical edge to that same setting, and so it it, it asks some very tough tough questions, and it doesn't provide the answers. And some people don't like them. Some people don't want that in their game. They want to shoot a dragon in the head with a, mm -hmm. with a rocket launcher. Mm -hmm. I go, well, you can do that in my game. And then you can ask yourself why afterward. But yeah. the point is, is that people can do that. These stories can be told within a role-playing game format. And it basically allows every GM to be an artist in their own right yeah. and create their own work. Even though your audience may be a five, you can still come off of it and saying, I created something that was entirely mm -hmm. my own and it was personal. Yeah, it's, it's very, it's a bit of a rush. Um, and for the most part, I don't use very many canned adventures. I'm, I'm very off the cuff and I have my own ideas and my notes and I go with it. Um, uh, I, I've, I've gotten more um, uh, amicable to, uh, to, to canned adventures recently. Um, and I think, I think the, the quality of them has, has definitely uh, increased um, with, with such a, a, a broader author uh, base um, with the internet opening up. There's a story you want to tell or some, some, somebody's written it out there or somebody's got something that you can draw from. It's like, oh, I want to I do a, a modern game uh, about a, a dragon that uh, uh, 
wants to eat the owner of a company or something like that. I'm sure there's a game out there that has something like that that I can draw from. And I mean, I'm just pulling it out of my head. It sounds kind of cool, actually, whatever. But um... <laughs> Wait, 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 let me write that down. <laughs> uh, now let's, I want to try something that's a little, little quicker. Um, uh, like in major influences on, on your work, um, uh, bringing you to where you, what you've achieved so far. Just like, all, not, I'm not saying lightning round, but uh, Brendan, who, who, what is, what has inspired you um, to, 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 to do the things you've done? Uh, uh, well, um, sorry if that seems a bit loaded. I don't know. <laughs> no, not at all. I just can't do it quickly. Um, yeah. I would say, uh, you know, uh, I really draw a lot from from pop culture and from music for for the things that I do. And then, of mm-hmm. course, from Dungeons and Dragons. I mean, I, I played so much D and D, you know, as a child. I mean, that was, you know, like at a certain point, the game became the influence. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, oh, don't everybody needs to bow down to to Gygax yeah, at one and, point um, or another. Yeah, and then uh, I mean, I, I you know, I, I'm blanking on anything specific, but I read a lot of sci-fi, um, yeah. and uh, you know, a lot of, I, lo- I love crime fiction. I read a lot of that, that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And as far as like how I phrase things, I try to, you know, I don't know, I sort of draw from that as well. <laughs> no, that's fine. That's I, again, I'm, I'm I'm not expecting deep, mind blowing <laughs> answers or anything. Uh, Jason, same question. Inspirations. Um, Kenneth Height. Uh, in our space, uh, John Tynes in our space, um, anybody who's out there writing something creative, um, I'm, I'm a big fan of that in our space. Nice. William? Uh, well, as far as the Mutant Epoch would be going, probably James Axler's Deathland series. I have a big stack of those. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, all their early D&D modules and games from TSR. Yeah, maybe Gosh. a little Mad Max. Oh yes, yeah. <laughs> oh, I love Mad Max. Yeah, I mean, New Nepok sort of a mishmash between Aliens Two, um, yeah, Mad Max, and Star Wars. It's kind of a, uh, it's a weird. All these things, they're all put in the blender. And yeah, New Nepok came out the other end. See, stuck, stuck to the wall. Chris. <laughs> Uh, when I was young, when it comes to gaming, Mike Pondsmith created the greatest canvas I could uh, I could have ever painted with. Um, I, I, I credit other people like Rob Heinsu and other people who created Fourth Edition were very inspirational. Uh, for me, I, I think the greatest inspiration is the artist I work with. Nick uh, provides uh, such an incredible uh, inspiration, which is weird because I sent him ideas and then he sends me something I didn't think of, and that creates this kind of conversation. Yeah. Um, when it comes to, to pop media, I, I grew up with Star Wars, Star Trek, and, and Alien. They were, they were my bag, and I would invest wholeheartedly in these franchises. And, and I think of those three, uh, Alien was the one that, that I, I fell in love with the most, which is clearly because of what I did later in life. Mm-hmm. And that became because Star Trek is, is filled, and Alien, the only way Alien is that it had a canvas it gave you a photo and they say a photo is worth a thousand words. And that's the thing about alien is that it gave you this amazing, amazing idea and didn't fill it. Mm-hmm. And that was the best thing because star Wars is filled. It's, yeah. you can't, it's so hard to create something original in star Wars and even star Trek is having that problem now. But even to this day, after all these novels, all these books, everything alien hasn't even reached the cusp. And when you were young and you were looking at, what was being delivered in just the first three or four movies, just in when you hit the nineties, you're like, there is so much to tell. There's so much. And that's when I, when I created my homebrew game, that was, that's the thing is like, there's so much space in yeah. space, <laughs> right? By the irony about, about aliens. So yeah. that, 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 that was always my favorite franchise growing up. So it, I, yeah. I've always taken it very personal. I, that's always been something special to my heart. So I, that's why yeah. I'm very happy. It's in good hands. Yeah, well, the aliens movies, is, I, I guess that like in, in that leaving a lot of mystery into where they come from. I think I think some of the the stumbles in the alien, uh, my opinion, <laughs> Andrew, um, in the in the alien canon is in trying to explain stuff to. Well, that was a shot to credit to, to Andrew. Like I said, it, it's, we, 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 <laughs> oh I, no, I know. <laughs> like I said, when I heard the alien game was coming out, I was like, uh oh, and I'm yeah. like, I better. <laughs> it's kind of like. Um, 
Like when Barney was just like, this beer better be the best in the world. You got lucky. <laughs> well, I think that was my opinion when I saw the alien, just like this better be. Yeah. It has to be yeah. And it was, and then that's great. It's like but when I, you saw I, the I, Lord of the Rings trailer for the first time, like back oh, in 1999, when the first trailer was coming out, we're all like, don't suck, don't suck, don't suck. And we saw that trailer and we're like, we haven't Ooh. seen the movie. It doesn't matter. This can't suck now. We yeah. know that. Right. Yeah. But even then we didn't realize how good it was going to be. Yeah. Um, but that's but, uh, the thing. Uh, that's yeah. Yeah. But Andrew, we see you uh, reeling from that. Uh, if you want, um, if you want to expand on that, or if you want to just go to your influences, I, I give think I'll, I'll do both of it. It's all right. Um, oh, well, of so, course it is. So first, expanding on that, I learned a lot with the Planet of Apes stuff because <clears throat> um, my first thing that I was hired to do over there at Fox was make sense out of the timeline because it's a mess. Okay, and. I used the I used the theory that was mentioned in two of the movies there to make that make sense, and that was that um, in in three and five they say uh, time is an infinite highway and an infinite number of lanes. Change your lane, change your destiny. I was like, okay, so the animated series happens in this timeline, and this spins out of this, and that that, and I thought I got this all figured out. It's perfect, and so many fans loved it, and other fans for furious that I dared to find their universe. Okay. Oh yeah. So so and I mean and as you've seen the there's still that there's people like that crazy guy who was on my page the other You're day. You're a mouse. But regardless, <laughs> I've had I I've I've had less of that with Alien mm -hmm. because I have purposely seeded throughout. Well if you prefer this this could have happened. Yeah. But there's notes and there, there's there's hooks in there Maybe Gibson's Alien Three is what happened instead yeah. of when you saw the theaters. Hey, it's up to you. You're the game master. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so you know, I, I've purposely done that to try to make everybody happy. Mm -hmm. um, I know when I release my canon list, that's when people flipped out or got you know excited, whichever either way, because I'm like, hey, this is what the studio says. Can only yeah. do right now. This is what my recommendations were. This is what they agreed to. This is what we're doing. And people are pissed off at that, but it's like, but none of that has to matter for you personally, mm -hmm. you know. So exactly, yeah. I mean, it, it doesn't. <laughs> um, but I, fans I, take I, things very personally. <laughs> I mean, that 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 blog post is my most popular blog post of all time. Yeah. But at the same time, I almost wish I hadn't put it up there because it started the same conflict again. You mm -hmm. know, <clears throat> that always will. Well, like when I saw it, I was I, I read through it and I was uh, pleasantly surprised to see that uh, Alien Isolation was actually considered uh, like top tier canon, which I think it's what one about of the, the other video, video game games. that no one wants to talk about. <laughs> that is that, no, that is myths and legends. <laughs> All right, good. I, I, I have wanna, a question. Oh, sorry, I, I, I want to amend my answer very quickly uh, about inspirations. Um, you're talking about fans and then people who are already writing content. Uh, other inspirations include players like Jacob Hardeen, Ben Sanders, Dan Bass. These are guys who I've been gaming with for ages. And when we game, they create things. And a lot of times I'd like to find ways to take what they've created and, and write into, into our stories. Mm -hmm. Of course, then there's always family. Yes. <laughs> I noticed you're, you're personally young. <laughs> it's in the room with you. Um, uh, we got a question from, uh, from, the, uh, from the comments. Um, Marcus wanted to know uh, if there are any uh, games or systems that you have recently been uh, inspired by. Uh, a new rule sets that have come out that have maybe changed the way you might look at uh, uh, how you might run things. Uh, anybody want to jump Not in with recently, that but like I said, no. when, when like, there's, there's, there was always a big story, but when fourth edition kind of started to fall and uh, Rob and a whole bunch of other guys went off and they formed 13th age. And I knew 13th age was there like, all right, now we're going to do it and we're not going to answer anybody. We're going to create our own system. We're going to take all the ideas we liked and, and make it. And I remember reading that going, Oh, you brilliant sons of bitches. I wished more people could <laughs> could follow you into this direction, but there was such this sour taste um, with uh, with fourth edition. It, not as many people uh, have discovered 13th Age as much as most people. And 13th mm -hmm. Age has this very kind of very dominant mechanic, but it's it's still something that's very easy to write for. I, I found writing for 13th Age was incredibly easy. And they also have an amazing fan base. Mm -hmm. uh, I just I just kind of wish that the book sold a bit better, but that's, that's <laughs> part of the issue. But like I said, I thought, th 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 of the new systems I've played in the last four or five years, 13th Age was probably, uh, it, it was the one that impressed me the most. 
Mm -hmm. right? I mean, I, yeah, we'll praise five fifth edition for what they've done, but when it comes to what the independents and small guys do, uh, they have, they have, they have the uphill climb. As somebody said, yeah. is it, there's, I, I wouldn't touch a rule system because yeah, I know how much work it takes. Yeah. Um, Anyone else? So I, yeah. Uh, so look, I mean, there are some really interesting rule systems out there. We've had a real revolution in, in systems that uh, if you, this isn't particularly new, but if you look at say Apocalypse World, you look at Fate, Fate Accelerated, mm -hmm. you look at, you know, Cypher. I mean, there's a ton of games out there that game systems that have come out that are, are interesting. They teach. You can read the game system and learn something about way people can game differently. And um, there's a lot of really good stuff out there. Um, recently, there's a um, kind of a narrative uh, journaling game for a solo journaling game called um, Thousand Year Vampire thousand year old vampire great mm -hmm. great game and it's interesting because even even though some people will look at that and wonder if that's actually a game or not uh, well it is and it teaches um microscope uh microscope doesn't have any dice it doesn't function like any of your traditional role-playing games but it's a role-playing game mm -hmm. and, and it does teach and there's a lot you can do with it you can pick it up and you can play that on a you know within three or four hours with your buddies anytime you want and you can use that for world building if you wanted to to port it so yeah, yeah ton of stuff out there a ton of really interesting game yeah. systems that, that are out there that teach yeah i would say uh, one child's heart by camden ray um I, that that absolutely blew my mind to see to see like a, you know a, a game about therapy that could be therapy itself it really sort yeah. of like she yeah. sort of changed my mind the kind of conflicts you could write about using the, the sort of paradigm of role-playing games that like i you know i don't know that i could do anything like that but i've got something new to aspire to i would put it that way mm -hmm. yeah, i agree with that yeah that sounds uh, really interesting to me i want to check that out um, yeah I, I i don't really have much to offer on this one except for the fact that i was my personally was just blown away and it's gonna sound like i'm just self-promoting but i was blown away by the stress mechanic that the uh, freely came up with yes um that that is that is the centerpiece of the alien rpg that's freaking fantastic um i i equated it to like the the insanity rolls in Call of Cthulhu. Yeah. Uh, not that I'm saying that it's the same or anything, but no, it's, it's not. But it's, it's the same. It's the it's same core theme. to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fantastic. Um, uh, for my own two cents, I encountered about a year ago a game called Dread, um, where the resolution mechanic is a Jenga tower, and I, I thought that, that was absolutely brilliant. That actually brings up a very good point, though. I because I, I, I would probably put a caveat on my uh, uh, a, a provision on my answer because I'm sticking with role playing because. In, since I've been with my uh, fiance now wife in the last four years, I went from having four board games to having 300 board games. Mm -hmm. And I've been analyzing them almost religiously, trying, you know, because we can't really copyright rules. So everyone's borrowing from somebody else. Mm -hmm. Someone creates an idea. Hey, I have a game called Dominion, which is a deck uh, making mechanic. And now there's a yeah. hundred games that use that same idea. And it, it's amazing. We're talking about the, the democratization of, of gaming. Board games have it down. And unlike role-playing games, especially Dungeons and Dragons, which is populated by a lot of conservative players that don't want a lot of change. Board games, it's all about pushing out and trying new ideas, creating new mechanics. So when it comes to inspiration mechanically, I have to point to the games I've been playing, the board games and seeing, because those games have yeah. to be perfectly concise. And I've been taking a lot of inspiration from some of these games that are, are taking ideas. I go, okay, how can because there's some of the some of the most popular board games that have come out are narrative role playing games. Yeah, and you know, yeah, in some cases you're not making your own character, but you're still involved in in a narrative story. And so yeah. I've been incredibly fascinated what they've been doing. I still like the freedom of what I do with a role playing game, mm -hmm. but I, but there's still stuff you can learn and you can pull from these these board games. And sometimes <coughs> I have a mechanic and go, I can make an entire character class for D&D from this idea in this board game that that uh, that no one thought could be pulled and and, yeah. and deconstructed. So I think, yeah, board games are, I think, a huge inspiration. Oh, yeah. Well, board games certainly are blurring the lines between uh, uh, like regular tabletop uh, uh, role-playing games and your expanded version of sorry or whatever you may have, uh, which is, it's it's encouraging to see and and, and so many great games out there. Um, things that I want to check out, and uh, but too too long a list for for right now, kind of thing. Um, I I think I'm going to come. Just, well, sorry, was somebody trying to say something? Yeah, I got just a oh. real quick one about inspiration. It's um it's rules agnostic. I was at um, coffee with Danny the other day, and he broke open this book. It's a hardcover of like one 
one page adventures kind of thing. It was a uh, one illustration, one map, and it was uh, it was fantasy world, but it was unbelievable. It was a huge hardcover tome. You might know it, James. I, um, if you've been hanging out with Danny at all, he's just, it was just a new book that he got from some Kickstarter. Anyway, I was just mm -hmm. totally blown away by this. Thing. What, what was the name it. of it? I don't remember. The name oh, of it, okay. But just I, I, I talked with him once in a while online. So yeah, these these uh, <laughs> you know these one page adventures are just mm -hmm. so creative. They're so tight, and I, I really. I'd love to get into the, a booklet of yeah. those. Or, well, like, that's what uh, I definitely want to do. Yeah, interesting you mentioned that because with Jason's um, project, um, we my, my first um, contribution to their uh, project, uh, Journal of the Machine, were, um, were what we call the narrative, n narrative frameworks, yes. which is essentially the one or two page uh, adventure framework. It, it doesn't contain crunch, it doesn't contain rules. You might have a couple of uh, the, the lore sheets that, that we've talked about, but really it's a, it's, a, it's a notes and a sequence of events that you give yeah. to a GM and they run it and they, they populate it however they need to. And it's the kind of thing, it's the kind of adventure I would love. That way I could, I could customize it to the way that I want, but I have the basic storyline sitting there. And I think, it's, I think it's absolutely brilliant. And I'm, I'm very proud to have been able to uh, submit a couple of those to, to them. Um, well, I submitted three, and uh, the one that I made in like two hours, they said, "Oh, we want this to be a scenario." I'm like, "Really? That one?" <laughs> so, super cool. Um, yeah, it was. I, I'm very proud of it. Um, I'm, uh, I'm going to go one more question because um, it's quite topical and quite possibly the reason that uh, that this uh, it happened today: um, COVID. And its effect on the industry and and even uh, your creativity. Um, uh, how 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 has it affected you, uh, like even personally and professionally, um, uh, within the scope of, of your your collected uh, industries, uh, Andrew? Uh, I, well, that's actually really interesting. Um, so I haven't talked much about this yet, but I um, Destroyer of Worlds. I finished that back in January. And it was a, not at all what it is now. It was about a virus that was out of control on a colony and nobody knew who had the virus. And it was this whole stress thing about that. And wow. we got to March and Thomas contacts me. He's like, yeah, we need to rewrite this now. This is <laughs> and, I, and at first I was like, no, sci-fi should be topical. It yeah. should make you think about what's going on in the world. I was on my little pedestal. Yeah, he's yeah. Like, he's like, normally I agree with you, but you don't write a story about 9-11. Uh, you don't write a story about a man escaping a burning building yeah. a day after 9-11. Yeah. And I said, God damn it, you're right. Yeah. So, you take so that story rewrote. and you move it aside and you get yeah. back to it in a year. Yes, yeah. 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 So that what that was is now sitting waiting for the next project but Excellent. um but yeah so you know that so it, it totally affected me big time just in that one little thing uh, i had to do a huge rewrite um between march and may um for something that i had spent previously like six or seven months working on in my spare time so um yeah that that happened also um you know i, I honestly in regards to working from home i have 90 percent of my life has been working from home since the past like 25 years so that really mm -hmm. um but but yeah it does affect your content um you you, you got to be aware of what's going on in the world when you release something because either you could be very topical or you could be very insensitive so i think it depends on how you approach it i mean I, you could have gone two ways on it you step sidestep it completely or you go at it headlong and say, right. this is what we're talking about. We're doing this. But um, in March, we didn't know what was going to be happening. And yeah. if three quarters of the country was dead from COVID by the time the book was released, that would have been bad. <laughs> that would have been very bad, yeah. In no, retrospect, definitely. though, would you have gone back and done it different? If I knew what it is now, I probably would have pushed more for us just to leave it the way it was. But I, but I will say this. I think what we released is actually stronger than what it was. So in the end, it, it's, it was better for it. I don't think that there's anything wrong with what was being done before, but I think that now knowing what I can, I do, that can also be something better that comes out later. So in the end, it was all for the best. It was just a nightmarish couple of months. How yeah. are we going to make this when the whole thing was based around something that we're not going to do now? Oh, that's awesome. 
Great yeah, well, most of us are introverts anyway, so I think it. You know, <laughs> I, that's, an, that's an assumption. That's what, what you know, one of us could be like. Oh, I love going outside, but no, I, I hate people. So um, <laughs> I think most of us. Yeah, the, I'm, I got got to co copy through that. So for that, like, thankfully, I got out of retail. So when the COVID hit, I was just like, well, not much has changed. My car has had the same tank of gas in it for four months. Uh, <laughs> my problem was that um, my books got printed in China when COVID hit in March. Oh dear. And then my distribution channel was in Florida in June. So it was just the worst possible combination. <laughs> so what should have taken three months took six because of the constant delays right. from border and so forth. So it was just like, where are the books? People go, where are the books? I'm like, they're in Florida. I don't know if Florida is going to exist in a couple of weeks, so I'll get back to you. <laughs> there are more important things in the world right now. I'm not going yeah. to pester them and go, where is my little role-playing game? Yeah. I don't care. You know, I know there's a virus outbreak, but people want to play D and D. So no, I, I wasn't, I had to give them their time to, to make sure that everything got sold, yeah. everything was safe, but it was just like, well, this is fantastic. And then at the same time I was getting married because you know, yeah. Not enough oh, hey. Real life, real life, man. William. Well, as you say, being a freelancer and a bit of an introvert, I didn't really notice that much difference, except the kids were home all the time for the first part. Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> now, what, one thing I did notice is sales really kicked off in May and June. Like people were stocking up on stuff to do at home or something. Yeah. But uh, definitely down to about half now, um, especially the Amazon yeah. sales, but PDF sales are still strong. But yeah, I didn't really notice too much difference other than, of course, I'm not sitting at a, a, a booth in CamCon right now. Yeah. The They're convention seems right. probably one of the big ones, yeah. 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 Well, I mean, we, we were supposed to have you last year, but you had um, some, some eye injury or something yeah. that happened. Yeah. Full retinal detachment. Yeah. How's that yeah. going? Are you, are you better? Are you 100%? Well, I kid people that it only hurts when I'm awake. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's, it's, that's that's by depressing. The, <laughs> by the end of the day, I'm just like, I can't even open this eye anymore. I'm just like, uh -huh. I need darkness. Now okay. with all the snow here, going out, it's snow blind. I got to wear two pairs of yeah. sunglasses. Well, next year, we'll have you there. Oh, yeah. Uh, it'll, be it'll be nice to finally meet you in person. So I'm stocking out. Yes. Jason. Yeah. So, you know, we released, uh, Sons of the Singularity released a um, product roadmap in January on, on Facebook. We said, look, these are the projects we're going to try to do this year. And um, come late February, early March, it was pretty clear that um, COVID was introducing a lot of um, business uncertainty. And uh, we even spent some time wondering whether or not we should delay a Kickstarter that we had planned. Um, we'd already done a lot of the work to, to do the Kickstarter, you know, had started to get collateral art, had started to think about how we were gonna structure it, had already identified who the project partners were. Um, and we watched it in March and then we made a go decision because life goes on and gaming goes on um so uh yeah it's difficult and, and it's a terrible thing um, um but uh i'd rather be gaming with you guys and my friends than sitting around being fearful of the zombie apocalypse really oh, fearful well, of the yeah. zombie apocalypse yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> brendan <laughs> well i'm that extrovert um, yeah, yeah, you're. The, I yeah. don't notice that, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, um, uh, I went a little mad at first. Like, uh, you know, usually I spend, I do like anywhere between sixteen and eighteen physical conventions a year, uh, representing for Joseph Goodman. I go and I run games all over the place, and um, it's kind of what I'm known for. And what I what I've been doing for the last. I don't even know how many years, you know. Been God, I want while. your job. <laughs> <laughs> Do you though? Careful what you wish for. Oh, yeah. But the, uh, but, uh, but, but you know what? It really suits me. You know what I mean? I love meeting new people. I love going out there and promoting the game. I'm not, it's, it's, this kind of thing is hard for me, but it's very easy for me to say, hey, here's a game I'm working on. Let me show it to you across the table. That's, you know, it's yeah. a lot easier for me. So um, yeah, I, the first couple of months I, I thought, oh, I'm gonna lose my job, this is over. And I, I, I sputtered for a while there. I had just turned in a very big project. And for a little bit, I was like, uh, I don't know what to do. I didn't know how to write without, you know, to without the normal sort of things I had, like, you know, all my normal stimuli, you know? Um, so I've kind of had to sort of reinvent it and um, sort of like my process, I sort of like re-put together, you know? Um, you know, I, I would, I would, you know, 
in, you know, in, in time, times past, I would go and brainstorm at least one day a week. I would sit in a coffee shop and I do very well with hubbub. I love writing, <laughs> and, you know, with like, you know, vague noise around and such. So, um, uh, and, and now I sit here and my cats attack me and I, you know, it's like, so uh, it's been hard, but um, you know, I feel like everybody in the whole world, you know, I'm adjusting and uh, it, it got to it there. I had a breakthrough with it where it was like, you know what, you can do this and you can, you know, you know, you can, you know, move on with it. So um, obviously it's changed my, my, my job up very much because I'm not going out and doing uh, convention outreach and I'm just not running the games like I, I normally do. Um, but I've been doing a bunch of online gaming and as much writing as I can and um, just sort of trying to, you know, trying to adapt to the new reality yeah. and the new situation that we are in. And it's been hard on me personally. Like I said, I, I you know, I've, I like being around people, you know, um, uh, and I miss my folks and I miss my family, mm. my extended family terribly. And I'm Stuff. terrified for what's going to happen to the world. And yeah. it's a constant distraction that eats into my creative energy. You know, like what's tomorrow going to be like? Um, it's two weeks from now going to be yeah like. exactly i mean half the people <laughs> on this panel are are well i think everybody on this panel is probably kind of interested in seeing what's going to happen um in, in two weeks because uh, in, in bc we have our provincial elections today actually um if you're viewing make sure you vote um so yeah no definitely uncertainty yeah. is 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 quite the thing yeah well this well, uh, this is yeah this has been fantastic guys um uh, you've all been very candid. You've said some, uh, told us some great stories. And stuff. By the way, look what um, I found, William. <laughs> How'd you get that? Now, he, oh, that's a very good question. I don't know. <laughs> this showed up from Dry School RPG. I ordered one of my books, a proof, and then this showed up in the box, and I don't know why. But it's a great book, but I don't know why I got it. So thank you. <laughs> for existing because somehow this landed on my shelf that's <laughs> wild <laughs> but um, literally i was just like honey do i still have the mutant epoch book she's like yeah like, fantastic seven, had it for years like... of, seven years of my life and all my retirement savings yeah, yeah. Well, there you go hopefully it works out for you I'm just magically um, one I, showed up on my door yeah yeah, I'd like to give you guys a chance to uh, maybe promote anything that you got coming up uh, uh we'll start with brendan uh, well, I have a new uh, adventure that just came out for the Dungeon Crawl Classics Horror Line. It's called The Web of All Torment, and um, uh, it's uh, you know, I if you if you like horror stuff and you like the DCC system, maybe you did, maybe you'll enjoy that. Um, and then of course the uh, the 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 new version of X Crawl is getting ready to um, to come out, so the beta rules are oh, right yeah. out right now. So you can go <laughs> online to GoodmanGames.com right now and um, and download the beta rules for free. And, uh, we'll put a link to that in the. And in, tell me, yeah. tell me all the things I did wrong, and uh, I can fix it. I got, I got a couple more weeks. <laughs> Jason, uh, well, uh, we're busy working on Journal to Indochine, which uh, we hope to uh, release early next year. Uh, that's going to be two books um, set in French Indochine from 1924 to 1954, uh, using the Call of Cthulhu system. Uh, so look for that. And um, of course, the Sassoon Files is available for digital download on drivethroughrpg.com. Yeah, we'll put some links in the in the comments as well for that too. Huh. Well, well, yeah, oh. you do have an interest, right? No, oh, I do. <laughs> Vested. I just don't want to come off as nonpartisan, shall we say? <laughs> Although, actually, I love all of you guys' stuff, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, William, um, because it's kind of relates to the COVID thing. We've got a solo play adventure coming out for the Mutant Epochs called Dog Days. So it's going to be um, pre-gen character, but you will be one character and see if you can make it through this sort of a uh, first person shooter sort of feel to it. Oh, All nice. those people wow. stuck, stuck at home during quarantine. So full art, um, by the way. Like painting. I love that. Really nice. Yeah. I wonder uh, who did that. amazing. Yeah, yeah I wonder. <laughs> uh, Chris. Uh, well, like I said, I uh, we finally got my uh, my GM screen. Like, literally showed up. Um, you want to talk about artwork? Yeah. Uh, sweet. That's the ultra modern GM that's screen. The, that's the ultra modern screen. Uh, swanky. And then the uh, ultra modern redo is now in print. This is the deluxe version. So unfortunately, these are kind of limited in quantity, but it's on Drive Through RPG. It's on cool stuff. And uh, I got uh, an, a board game I'm working on called Naramata. 
based on Naramata Wine Country. It's a wine tourism game. That's going to go up that on Kickstarter. Okay, yeah, Kickstarter. That's going yeah. up in Kickstarter in November. Okay. It took us a bit longer to get the wineries on board, but now they're right, on board. So. Yeah, be sure to, to message me when it comes on, and we'll put it on uh, on the website for you and, and, and promote that for you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, for Andrew. Uh, well, the Alien Starter Kit and Destroyer of Worlds just came out. Uh, the Starter Kit also has uh, Chariot of Gods in it, which is the first adventure I wrote for them. Um, I can't make any major announcements about all that stuff, but I will be. I do have other projects and works from other gaming companies that will be announced very soon. Oh, really? Excellent. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I'll, I'll give you some secrets later on privately. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, and also, uh, Free League has announced that the uh, Colonial Marine book. Uh, campaign book, which we're I've been working on forever, is uh, going to be uh, be up for pre-order, and you'll at least get the PDF before the end of the year, from what I understand. Oh, if, awesome! I don't know if the yeah. book works different times, but yeah, um, I've been waiting for that one. Yep, that's going to be coming soon. So, excellent. Okay, super. Well, um, uh, I'd like to take a moment to uh, th uh, thank you guys. Um, we've also got a bunch of uh, vendors who've helped CamCon uh, presently and in the past and hopefully in the future. Uh, Adventure Dice, uh, Artwork and Cute Things, uh, Chained in the Loops, Chibis, uh, Fanatic Domain, High Octane Comics, a big, big uh, part of our success in town here, Kitty's Costumes, Metal Core Collectibles, uh, PC Perler, uh, Playing with Perlers, and uh, that might be the same thing. I don't know. Spooky Kitties one, uh, Star Wars Emporium, uh, Stick It To Him, and Sweet Legs, Kamloops with Alana. So we'd like to, to do a shout out to those guys. Thank you very much for for your support, and uh, and uh, uh, we hope to see you at CamCon next year when we run things, and and you all as well, uh, in some fashion or other. I'd, I'd love to see you again next year. So oh oh dang it, ah, I'm still here. <laughs> no, he's not. It's just us now. No, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so I, 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 you, Ken I was like, that's a pretty abrupt ending. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're all good. But uh, yeah, um, again, thank you so much for taking the time to come out and, and, and have just a, a wonderful little discussion about, uh, about some of the stuff that we love here. Um, uh, this has gone over uh, better than I could have possibly imagined. Uh, uh, you're all great. And, uh, and I hope to talk to you again many times in the future. Thanks so uh, much. Thanks for having us. Not a problem. Okay. Y'all have a good evening. Uh, do you want to stay on for a minute when we when we shut things down? Sure. Good, good night, meeting Anton. all you guys. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for watching.